You're about to witness a culinary revolution. We've gathered America's most talented cooking prodigies to compete against executive chefs with years of training and decades of experience. I don't want to be treated like a kid. I'm a chef. Tonight, surf and turf expert Drew Zhang goes head to head against the prodigies in three rounds of grueling competition. Winning today would be bragging rights. Let's go. At stake, the one tool chefs can't live without, their reputation. To not win, I would go crazy. Ooh. My worst fears came true. Chef Drew, you're going down. Chef Drew and the prodigies put it all on the line for bragging rights. I hope my experience will carry me through. It's the superstars of tomorrow. This is coming down to the wire against the titans of today. He doesn't have enough time to make it. It's a battle of epic proportions. Get it on the plate, guys. Nice job. And it all starts now on Man vs. Child Chef Showdown. I'm your host, Adam Gertler, and tonight it's a culinary showdown in three rounds. Our first judge is celebrity chef, cookbook author, and owner of the restaurant group Mike Isabella Concepts, Mike Isabella. Our next judge is a co-owner of Tarzan E. Jane and private chef to Hollywood's elite, Alia Zane. Tonight's competitor is a Florida man who's apprenticed under highly reputable chefs Norman Van Aken and Charlie Trotter. He's currently the executive chef of Snapper's Waterfront Restaurant and Saloon. I've been an executive chef now for 20 years. I can cook anything, Caribbean, Chinese, obviously French. I'm excited to see these kids in action, but I'm not gonna throw the fight just because they're kids. But I have the knife skills and a formal education, so I am definitely a force to be reckoned with. Please welcome Chef Drew Sang. Chef Drew walks through the door. He looks very tough. He's here to compete. Chef, welcome to the Man vs. Child Kitchen. Thank you. Tonight, you'll be competing in three different challenges against the prodigies. Tonight, we have Chef Esty, Chef Zion, Chef Cloyce, Chef Emily, and Chef Holden. You guys make me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I have a feeling you're going to like tonight's theme. All challenges will involve cooking with a genre of proteins known as Seafood. Awesome. Chef Chu is a seafood master. He works with seafood for a living, which requires lots of technique, lots of skill, and I think he's going to be a tough one to beat. You know the deal. You see food, you eat it. Being a chef in the Florida Keys, that's the type of cuisine we have at Snappers. So I'm going to bring something to the table today that they're going to learn from. But yeah, I'm pumped. I'm pumped for this. Prodigies, who are you going to pick for round one? We need to make sure that we're setting in somebody who is going to really give it their best. Somebody who uses seafood a lot and won't be intimidated by unknown ingredients. We choose Chef Esty. <laughs> Chef Esty, when you're done doing the robot, please enter the kitchen. <laughs> Woo! Go, Esty! She may be eight years old, but don't underestimate her and her love of the gourmet. I love everything seafood, so I think I'll be great for the first round. Even though Chef Drew is an expert in seafood, I'm gonna crush him like a little ant. Please welcome Chef Esty. She's full of energy, she's super happy, and it's contagious. Today's round one challenge is Pokey. For this challenge, we want you to create your version of this raw Hawaiian fish salad. I can remember being as young as two and loving ahi tuna pokey, even though I thought it was watermelon. Poke is not a hard dish for me, so I'm gonna think outside the box and put my own spin on it. Judges, what makes a really good poke? Poke is all about the marinade. It's robust and savory in flavors. Right now, it's having a huge moment. Don't be afraid to experiment. It's deceivingly simple, so pay close attention to the, the knife cuts. Everything needs to be same size so that the end result is homogenous throughout the whole dish. Thank you, Mike and Alia. OK, now, chefs, the judges will base their decision on creativity, presentation, adherence to the spirit of the challenge, and, of course, taste. 
The winner of this challenge will get an advantage in round two. History has shown us that if you get the advantage in this round, your chances of keeping the advantage in the all-important winner-takes-all third and final round are much, much better. You have 30 minutes to prepare a poke that will wow the judges. Be bold and carpe diem. Your time starts now. Let's go, SD. Hey, hey, hey. I run to the giant tuna because I'm awesome. <laughs> that weighs more than she does. Oh my God, don't drop it. I'm kind of torn because I'm competitive by nature. You know, I'd like to think I'm a natural born winner, but Chef Esty reminds me of, of my daughter. <laughs> Thank you. Come on, Esty, let's go. You got this, Esty! I'm making tuna and salmon poke served on top of soba noodles with a creamy sesame sauce. I think this idea is kind of inspired by my local sushi place and also my imagination. For this challenge, I'm planning to make a smoked poke with wasabi aioli and crispy pickled ginger chips. And by smoking it, I think I could put a, a twist on poke that isn't seen too often. Yellowfin tuna, this is perfect for poke. It's important that I make sure that my knife skills are precise and consistent and even so that it marries just right. Whoa. Did you see what just happened? Okay, that's, whoa, that's enough. I'm having a bit of trouble with the water. Kid problems. I never had cookie <laughs> with noodles, but I thought noodles would be unique from the classic rice. Getting the water boiled is the first thing I need to do because I need to get my sobo noodles in, but still have enough time to cool them so they're able to be nice and cool. <laughs> Chef Drew, what are you making? I'm gonna do a, a smoked poke. The crunch component I'm gonna put on there is gonna be some crispy pickled ginger chips. You don't want too much smoky flavor because it'll completely overpower the entire dish. Yeah, it's a very fine line between just smoked enough and too smoky. Maybe that's not a very good idea. I gotta coat the pickled ginger in some flour first, and they tend to stick together, so you kinda gotta use your fingers on this one. Make sure it's evenly coated, then I'm gonna drop it in the fryer. You gotta make sure your oil's right on, because you don't want it to be too hot or it's not gonna work. So I'm making my poke of tuna and salmon. I think this salmon makes it very delicious. One of the challenges in making a delicious poke is the knife cut, because you never wanna bite into a big piece of fish. You know, it's interesting that Esty was chosen for this challenge. I know that she really loves sushi, and she's actually working now to learn how to cut it properly. So maybe it's a good challenge for her. I love sushi, any type of sushi. Tuna, salmon, yellowtail, avocado. Yum. Pulling the ginger out of the fryer, they're bubbly and crispy. Look at that, how they bubble up. You know, you got a good one when they bubble up like that, just like a potato chip. I think it's gonna be a good addition. The tuna being soft and the pickled ginger chips are gonna have that real hard zip zap that you really want on a crunch component. Job well done at this point. This water is just not boiling. Even with the lid on, it's just not boiling. Not yet. If I can't do the noodles right now, I can't make them my dish in time. She needs to get her marinade in right away. The fish also needs time to chill because warm pokey is disgusting. Chef Esty, she's super flustered and she's not doing her best this round. Young prodigies often have so much going on in their minds that their bodies physically can't keep up. So that could contribute to Esty's sort of scattered energy. Right. Oh. The marinade for the poke has to be a little tart. You do want a little bit of tang. You want a little bit of sweetness in there. I'm making like a sweet soy reduction and trying to dissolve the sugar just a little bit. I gotta heat it up so it's not uh, grainy, but then I gotta make sure I have enough time to chill it because I don't wanna pour it on the tuna and cook the tuna. Now it's time to start my creamy sesame sauce. Wow, okay, uh, sauce. How you doing, SD, you good? Rushing a bit. I add sesame paste, soy sauce, and waste wine vinegar. That's really good. Jeff, 15 minutes remain. 15 minutes left. My water's ready. The water finally starts to boil, but I'm so behind. This is not good. I don't think I'm doing very good on time right now. The soba noodles, they have completely different textures when they're hot versus when they're cold. She is going to need to chill them. I'm worried this isn't going to come together the way she wants. Essie, looks like you had a little boil over there. What's in there? 
I'm saving noodles. I think your noodles might be good to go here. Ooh, yeah, Let they are. See. I like to taste the noodles, so. Oh yeah, it looks like they're done. Mmm, perfect. I'm not necessarily relieved that my noodles are ready. <sighs> oh dear. I wish they were ready earlier. All right, good luck, Esty. This looks great. Now I have to put them in the freezer so they're able to be nice and cold. Otherwise, we'll have warm noodles on a cold plate with cold poke. That would be horrible. <laughs> Chef Drew. Yeah. How's it going? It's going good. What are you working on right now? Right now, we're just going to plate, top it with pickle ginger, then we're going to inject smoke right into that. And how does it not cook the fish? It's a cold smoke injection. Ah, so it's cold smoke. So it's kind of like when you smoke lox or something like that. Yeah, kind of, except we're actually doing everything that they do in 60 days and 60 seconds. Excellent. Well, there's a little bit less than 10 minutes left. Very excited to see what you come up with. Good luck. I leave my noodles in the freezer for about three minutes because of how small amount of time I have. It's so warm. My noodles are melting hot. This is not good. If this doesn't cool down in time, my dish would fail. Five minutes, five minutes. I leave my noodles in the freezer for about three minutes. It's so warm. My noodles are melting hot. I don't want to serve hot noodles on a cold plate. If this doesn't cool down in time, my dish would fail. The aioli is basically mayonnaise. So here we go with mayonnaise. I'm gonna grab the wasabi. So I'm gonna make a wasabi aioli. I can whip it up by hand and get the consistency I want and the flavor I want. Now I'm in business. Two minutes remain. You should be plating. My warm noodles may be pretty bad, but I have to plate. I add my salmon and tuna, then some edamame. Then I sprinkle some black sesame seeds. And last but not least, Pokake is a Japanese rice seasoning. It the kind of like little fish flakes. It gives it flavor you would get from salmon and tuna, but makes it stronger. And it's really good. At my restaurant, I have a couple dishes that we actually smoke. We send it to the table smoking, but now I gotta finish everything within the time limit. Let's go, you got it. You got it. Woo! Make it perfect. Five, four, three, two, one. It's banana time for Esty. Step away from the plates. Esty! Chef Esty now able to appreciate a banana with her newly acquired front teeth. <laughs> I'm pretty confident in my dish. It's looking good. The smoke is super thick. I'd put it on the menu, I'd sell it. You know, I'd eat it, I'd order it. I'm happy with this. Okay, chefs, please bring your plates up to the judges. I did my best, but my noodles are very warm, so I'm worried they're going to stick together. Chef Esty, please explain your dish. This is my tuna and salmon poke served on top of soba noodles with a creamy sesame sauce. Uh-oh. No, they're going to ding her on that because they're all stuck together. My noodles are all stuck together. That's no good. Chef Esty, on your dish, I really like the creamy sauce, sesame seeds, and I also liked the flavor of the noodles themselves. Uh, really balanced well and made it taste delicious. But unfortunately, I think as a whole, if you had more finesse, the dish wouldn't be as clunky as it is. The noodles themselves wouldn't be stuck together. You need to pay more attention to the details that you're doing. Esty, I like the idea of you combining the salmon with the tuna. So you had two different flavors of fish, two different textures of fish. Uh, and I also really liked your noodle salad. Thank you. Overall, you know, the dish had flaws throughout it. Uh, some of the noodles were sticking together, the way the fish were cut. I mean, I had big chunks of salmon like this. Chewing on raw fish, when you get big chunks like that, is not always a pleasant feeling in your mouth. You want everything to be balanced and to be even. I've seen better food from you. I want better food from you. This is not good. I agree with my knife cuts being big on the fish. I was stressed in the kitchen, and maybe it was a mistake to go that far out of the box. Chef Drew, please explain your dish. Uh, what I prepared for you today is a smoked poke with crispy ginger chips. Some manual labor involved. That's cool. That actually is awesome. They seem to really like yours. I hope they do. Chef Drew, 
I think that everything uh, married well. You had a really nice marinade for the fish itself. I liked the, the texture of the seaweed on the bottom. I thought that that added another layer of flavor to your dish. What didn't work for me is uh, the actual temperature of the fish. I know that you smoked it, so it added a, a slight bit of heat to it. And I think that if you had a nice cold fish, it would have been uh, a little bit less overpowering. Chef Drew, I really enjoyed your dish. I like the smoke when you open it up at the table. You can smell it, you can see it. You're getting the people involved. With that being said, I really didn't enjoy the size of the tempura and the ginger. I had to like kind of move that out of the way or pull it out and I couldn't really enjoy everything together, so it was a little bit harder for me to eat. Smaller cuts would have made it a better dish. I definitely agree with the criticism given me. It should have been colder. I should have made it where they could actually have every component on that fork. I wasn't thinking. You gave us two spectacular dishes. Please give us a moment to discuss. His dish looks so much more like the thing you'll find in a restaurant, and mine looks like a thing where you find in like a small diner, but it tasted good. So I could still win on flavor. Wow, this is really tense. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I won this round with my dish alone and the experience I put into it. But, you know, who? All right, Mike, Alia, who is the winner of round one? The winner is... Cross your fingers, cross your legs, cross your eyes. The winner is... Chef Drew. Thank you. Chef Drew, you had a nice presentation. I like the layers that you have with the seaweed on the bottom. Really reminded me of being back in Hawaii. I won this round because of my experience. Maybe the moment will keep going. Nice job, Chef. Thank you. I tried my hardest and it's kind of upsetting. I didn't get the menu board for my team. Congratulations, Chef Drew. Thank you. Now, this means you get to choose an advantage from the menu board in round two. This next challenge involves a protein that, like our executive chef, loves the warm waters of Southern Florida. Don't be a hater, because you'll have to cook with gator. Oh. Oh. Yes, this lethal lizard actually yields some very delicious meat. For this challenge, we want you to make an entree that highlights it. I can't even imagine eating an alligator. Ugh. I cook with alligator, and uh, I'm pretty familiar with it. So I, I would assume I'd have an edge. Mike, Alia, any advice for the gator? Alligator meat has a very tough texture. Look for a way to balance that texture with some of your sides and sauces. But this meat is also very tasty. Don't try to cover the flavor profiles of the meat. It's best to highlight it and let the ingredients of the dish complement it. Thank you, judges. OK, Esty. Which of your fellow teammates will be competing with Gator in round two? Chef Holden. I choose Chef Holden because he has experience cooking alligator, and he's our bizarre food boy. Chef Holden, please enter the kitchen. Come on, Holden, you can do it. He dances, cooks, and sails. There's no situation that this 15-year-old can't wrestle. I may be the only person in the box that has cooked with alligator. But then again, our competing chef is from Florida, where they have alligator. So this is going to be a difficult challenge. But I really want to bring my team to victory. Please welcome Chef Holden. Yeah! Holden! You got this, Holden. Chef Holden is very serious. So I know I'm in for a challenge. This round, the menu items are, if it pleases the jury, make your opponent prepare a snack for the prodigies. One stop shop. Your opponent will only be allowed one trip to the pantry. Station vacation. Force your opponent to stop working at any point for five minutes. Please take the first one. Snack, snack. I think snack. you should make a snack. snack. Yes! yes. 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 I thought that would be a good one, because now he's got to dedicate his time to appease the many chefs. Chef Holden, today you'll be making a fine assortment of finger foods for our prodigies. That could be bad, because you lose time, but that's great for us. I'm hungry. Yeah, I'm hungry, too. <laughs> OK, chefs, you have 45 minutes to make a gator-based entree. And your time starts now. Yeah, let's go, Holden! Come on! Sorry. <laughs> 
gator has a distinct taste. It's kind of swampy, kind of muddy tasting. I'm gonna use the leg because it has more gator flavor. All right. For this round, I'm gonna make a uh, down south fried buffalo gator salad. It's a little scary going up against a chef that has alligator on his menu. This is gonna be a tough round. But my strategy is to be more creative. I'm gonna make an alligator piccata with a creamy polenta. Piccata is a very basic Italian sauce. Doing this should give it a creative twist, and creativity is what I'm all about. So I get a carton of chicken stock and just get that boiling. I'm going for a very typical, like, southern preparation. I add in the polenta at certain increments and make sure to keep stirring it because polenta does burn extremely easily. I think that we should get, like, chocolate and peanut butter dipped bananas. This disadvantage sort of makes us turn on our teammate because we want food. <laughs> but we still want Holden to win. Try yeah. Well, I know, but it'd be cool if he won and we got a really nice snack. That'd be double points, yeah. Chef Drew, what kind of cheese is that? This right here is just a little pecorino. I'm gonna make little uh, little cheese twills with them. Okay. You know, it's that real good crispy stuff on the edge of the pizza or the grilled cheese sandwich that you like. I need to get started on the snack. I have to please the jury, but I don't want to waste too much time, so I look in the freezer. There it is. Chicken strips, mozzarella sticks, french fries, and tater tots. We're getting frozen stuff, guys. No matter if it's frozen or not, I'm going to eat it all. I'm gonna marinate the gator with a little bit of Tabasco, salt and pepper, and a little olive oil. We're going for that buffalo feel. So I'm gonna make a basic blue cheese dressing. Uh, use the blue cheese, buttermilk, a little lemon juice, and Tabasco goes in it. Blend it up, make sure that it's uh, pretty smooth. I don't want it too clumpy. So I get all the frozen snacks in the fryer and just let them sit. I really can't focus on this. I need to start my alligator. Here comes the tenderizing. Alligator meat is really tough. So I just have to pound it out with full anger. And he's angry today. Good thing he's taking it out on the alligator. Right? <laughs> I'm a little bit afraid. Uh, little known fact that prodigies actually enjoy snacks. Little known fact, Mike Isabella enjoys lots of snacks. And another little known fact, Alia likes snacks. All right, hold it. How's it going? Fine. How are you doing? That was a pretty bad disadvantage, huh? It seems like you're making like a whole appetizer sampler platter for the prodigies. Yay! And nicely presented, too. Thank you, Holden. Enjoy. Mm. These are yummy. How do you feel about time? You have 20 minutes left. Feel fine about time. I'm gonna start on my alligator probably in two minutes. Great. All right, good luck, man. I can't wait to see how it comes out. Thank you. Chef Drew, you didn't get yeah. any chicken nuggets over here. I didn't. I guess I'm chopped liver. So tell me what's going on. Got what do you make? a little bit of baby spinach. We're going to make a nice buffalo gator salad. Buffalo gator sounds like an unholy hybrid that <laughs> might be on like a sci-fi movie yeah. of the week or something. I'll show you. I'm going to swim fry it or flash fry them. OK. You're hoping that it's going to be crunchy and tender. Crunchy, tender. It's going to wilt the salad just a little bit. Good luck, Chef. Thank, Thank you. Man. All right, let's try this. Ten minutes remain. Ten minutes in the round. I'm working on getting started on the sauce that's going to go with the gator. I get started on piccata sauce. I saute some shallot and garlic. I add in my capers as well as my preserved lemons. Then I put the alligator in and baste it. I realized that picking a salad probably wasn't the best idea because I get everything done with too much time to spare. I'm hoping that by putting the gator on top that it shines enough to get a win. But I'm worried that it might not be enough. Five minutes remain in the gator round. I realized that picking a salad probably wasn't the best idea because I get everything done with too much time to spare. I should have thought of that earlier. Now I feel like I've wasted my time. All that matters right now is getting everything on the plate. I have to make sure that my dish is better than Chef Drew's. Coming up on 30 seconds. 30 seconds left. Plating now. This is getting down to the wire. You got this, Holden. Five, four, 
three, two, one. Stop cooking. Step away from the gator. Oh, Chef Holden definitely turned it up and tightened the screws, and I feel the pressure after seeing his dish. It really makes me want to eat it. I'm nervous. <laughs> me too. My dish looks great. Looks like a winning dish. I'm pretty sure I can get an advantage in the next round for the prodigies. Chef Holden, please present your dish. Here I have made for you an alligator piccata with creamy pecorino polenta. I hope they like it. Chef Mike is Italian, so if he likes my sauce, it's good. Chef Holden, I like that you decided to take a classic dish of the piccata and instead of using veal or chicken, you use the alligator. I also appreciated the kind of acidic sauce in with everything to kind of balance out the richness of a fried alligator. But the polenta was too thick. You gotta measure out the right amount of stock because if you start off with a right amount, it's gonna hold its shape a little bit better. It's gonna stay more creamy than if you were to like start with the wrong amount of stock and then add it, it's gonna just keep acting like a sponge. Chef Holden, I really enjoyed this dish today. You know, I love a piccata. I obviously I grew up in an Italian household. I really love this hand sauce that you went with there. All that came together, I got two words for you. Finishing salt. I watch you season. You pick up a little bit and you do a little pinch. I've been eating for a living before you were born. My palate accepts salt. I want your food seasoned better, period. Yeah. If I lose because of salt, that'd be terrible. Chef Drew, please explain your dish. Uh, it's just a good old down south fried alligator salad. Looks delicious. I hope the judges like the fun approach that I took to this dish. I don't want to lose momentum. Chef Drew, what I really enjoyed about your dish was the actual gator itself. I thought it had a nice texture and it had a nice crispy crust on the outside. And the actual meat itself was nice and tender. Thank you. But like with Chef Holden, there was not enough salt. And also, I think that you could have done a lot more in that time allotted and uh, really made the, the gator the star. Chef Drew, I like the cut of the gator. I like cut it small, cut it in strips, very easy to eat. It was also very tender. And I also thought your dish was very colorful. You know, I thought the blue cheese was very overwhelming. When I took the first bite of the salad, I tasted the blue cheese. I didn't really taste anything else. Gator is a very mild thing. This is a dish that honestly, both of us know from chef to chef, you could have made this in 15 minutes. Yeah. That's not what we want here, and that's not what you want to showcase as a chef. So please step it up for the next round. OK, Chef. It makes me feel good that at least I cooked the gator right, but I probably should have picked something a little bit more difficult than a salad. I thought it would be fun, but it didn't work. Chefs, you guys gave us a lot to chew on. So please give us a moment while we discuss. I'd like to think I'm a natural born winner. And even though I'm just having so much fun here, I didn't come here to lose. Winning this round is vital because we need that advantage in the next round. I hope I can pull it off for my team. Well, Mike Elia, who's the winner of round two? The winner is... The winner is... Chef Holden. Even though I went in with a disadvantage, I turned it around. Now I'm starting to think we can win this. Chef Holden, it screamed gator entree, and that was the main thing on the plate was the gator itself. Chef Drew, this is more like a salad. It didn't really feel like a hearty entree. I understand. His dish looked great. And to make polenta and everything else, I mean, how cool is that? But round three is winner takes all, and I'm going to turn it up a little. Congratulations, Chef Holden. Your team wins an advantage going into the winner takes all third and final round to be presented and judged by our master chef in a blind taste test. As usual, our third round is a trio, meaning you will have to compose three dishes. Our special guest today is a culinary giant. She's worked as the chef de cuisine under world-renowned chef Eric Repair at 10 Arts and sous chef at his three Michelin-starred restaurant, La Bernardin. She will partner with her very own Mike Isabella on a new French Mediterranean seafood concept called Requin. Please welcome Chef Jen Carroll. 
Chef John's a pioneer in this industry. It's important that I make something that the difficulty level is that of somebody of her caliber. So guys, this being a seafood themed challenge, I thought the best thing to do would be a trio of shellfish. Yeah. Wow. Chefs, some ways it seems like a simple challenge to make three shellfish dishes, but there's so much you can do with these ingredients. It's almost more difficult deciding on your approach. Working with shellfish is tough. You really gotta know what you're doing. So I hope my experience will carry me through. Thank you, Chef Carol, for your help in presenting round three. We will call you back as soon as our chefs have completed their cook. Thank you. Good luck, chefs. It's time now for the big question, Holden. Which one of your teammates is gonna bring it home for the prodigies in round three? I choose Chef Cloyce. Chef Cloyce! Cloyce is a perfect choice for this round because one of his favorite things to cook is a seared diver scallop. He's 14 years old, but don't let his charisma fool you. When it comes to competition, he's a killer. I've got lots of experience with shellfish. In culinary school, we've been working a lot with shellfish. We've been learning the classical techniques, the different preparations. There's tons of stuff you can do with it. I think I'll be able to execute the challenge really well. Please welcome Chef Cloyce. Yeah! You can do it, Cloyce! Nice to meet you. I've seen Chef Cloyce in action, and he's a force to be reckoned with. This round, the menu items are... Check your work. Your opponent cannot start cooking until a set of mise en place tasks are completed to judge Mike Isabella's satisfaction. Prime time. Take 10 minutes off your opponent's cook time. Yeesh. Ill-equipped. Rob your opponent of essential cooking equipment. Chef Cloyce, which item would you like to choose from the menu board for round three? Let's go prime time. We're gonna go prime time. We're gonna take 10 minutes off your opponent's cook time, which means in this one hour round, you're only gonna have 50 minutes to complete everything. I'm sorry. That's okay. Okay, chefs, it all comes down to this. You have one hour to create an inspired shellfish trio and truly impress Chef Jen Carroll. And don't you dare clam up. <laughs> Chef Cloyce, your time starts now. Yay! Yeah! You got this, right. some of these. Shrimp, too. So Chef Jen Carroll is opening up a seafood restaurant with Chef Mike Isabella. She's obviously got skill in the seafood area. Everything's gotta be perfect. Let's go. Knowing Chef Drew's background, he knows everything about seafood. We saw him make smoked pokey round one. Who does that? He's gonna be a tough one to beat. I'm gonna be doing a seared diver scallop with creamed corn, a seafood chowder, and my final dish is a deconstructed oyster po' boy. A what did I? Po' boy. A po' boy. What's a po' boy? It's a sandwich. Oh, he's gonna shuck the oysters. Shuck, shuck, shuck. You have to have a nice shuck. point on your oyster knife, and you've just gotta push as hard as you can. Come on. There's a high likelihood that I could put this through my hand and then get some terrible disease and die. <sighs> there we go. Chef Drew, you have five minutes until you can start cooking. That's five minutes gone in this round. Thank you. How's it going? It's going good. I've still your, got time to kill, so. I've got good knife skills. I'm seeing how he's holding his knife. He's holding it like a chef. He's holding it like a boss. It's important to keep your fingers in this business. <laughs> <laughs> if I get out of this business with all my fingers, then it's a win situation. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it is. He makes me nervous, uh, especially having only 50 minutes to pull off a win. My favorite chowder is New England clam chowder, just because you can't beat the classics. I start to render out four slices of smoked bacon. The smokiness is gonna really complement my seafood. Then I saute onion and celery. And I'm also going to be serving my clams in the shell. It's gonna make it very obvious that there's seafood inside of my chowder. Chef Drew, start revving that engine. Get ready. Get ready. Your time starts now. I'm thinking if you want to win this, you're going to have to really show your experience. You're going to have to bring it all, and I could do that. I've got enough years under my belt. So what's your planning on making? I know I want to go with a nice uh, classic risotto. Risotto? My first dish is going to be a classic lobster risotto topped with a butter poached lobster claw. My second dish is steamed clams with a sriracha butter and a kimchi tempura garnish. My third dish is going to be a pancetta wrapped sea scallop atop eggplant ragu all of which I've cooked before many times. I start off with the risotto. I gotta make sure I caramelize it. I'm gonna use a little bit of the seafood broth. I mean, you probably should have the stock hot as well, but I'm cutting corners because I'm 10 minutes behind. 
Next, I'm going to make an eggplant ragu. It's going to be the foundation where the scallop sits on. you got to start by uh, sweating the eggplant with a little bit of salt. We're going to start it in the pan. We're going to finish it in the oven. Chef Cloyce, what are you cooking there? Some croutons. Since I'm making a deconstructed sandwich, I need to add some bread somewhere. You know what I like about where Cloyce is going? He's going to do classic dishes and put his touches on it. You know, Cloyce just won Student of the Year at his Culinary Conservatory. And one of the highlights they said of his performance was that he was a team player. He seems to have a lot of honor. He's like a, a, a young cooking knight. I want to give him a goodbye pet before he dies. I'm gonna use the entire lobster on this dish, but I'm gonna cook them in different ways. So I separate the claws because I wanna butter poach the claws, and then I steam the tail and head because that's gonna go into the risotto, and then the butter poached claw is gonna go right on top as a garnish. Sorry, buddy. Chef Cloyce, how's it going? It's going pretty well. How's it going with you? Tell me what you're making. I am gonna do a chowder. This is gonna be a clam chowder? Seafood chowder. Shrimp, bay scallop, and clam. Okay. What are you dredging the oysters in? Flour and cornmeal. That makes me think that you're doing Louisiana proud. A little bit. Good luck, Cloyce. Thanks. Okay, chef, how are you? Good. And tell me the dishes you're making. I'm going to do a lobster risotto. Is this the rice for that? Yes, it is. You've stopped this here because you're going to, you need to do it. We've got 25 minutes. I just wanted to stop the risotto from cooking on the stove where it might get a little mushy and try to thin it out on a tray to hopefully let it cool. Great. As you know, Chef Jen's only work for Eric Repair at La Bernadana, three-star Michelin restaurant, so no pressure. Good luck. No, thank you. Knowing Chef Jen's going to sample my cooking. It's an honor, but it's also scary as hell. A seared dyra scallop will be one of the best ways to go because it's a blank canvas you can create into anything. I'm going to pan roast the scallops and start with whole butter because it gives it that nice, really dark brulee. I'm going to finish it in the oven just to get it crispy. Putting the scallops in the oven, is that going to crisp up the prosciutto without overcooking the scallop? No. You almost have to make a sacrifice. You do you want really caramelized scallops, or do you want really crispy prosciutto? There's a ton of danger in overcooking scallops, especially when you're pan roasting them. It's very delicate. Chefs, 15 minutes. The oysters go directly into the fryer and come out once they're nice and golden brown. I need to have that crispy crust in order to make this deconstructed po' boy perfect. Boys, how's it going? You know, it's all copacetic until these last eight minutes, and then it's chaos. Time is getting away from me. I need to add this seafood to my chowder, or it won't cook thoroughly. So here, once the clams open up, I take them out of the chowder so they don't overcook. I add my bay scallops and my shrimp. Jen Carroll is going to be looking for perfectly cooked shellfish. And if it's not, it could be the reason that we lose. Everything's happening right at the last minute because of seafood. So I throw the clams in, throw in some of the garlic slices, and of course, sriracha. I know it's going to steam well, and we're going to add the butter. I hope I timed it right. Five minutes left. I started to sear my live scallop. And as I'm searing it, I notice that it's not getting the right color. It's edible, but you don't want to eat it. All right. Start over. Four minutes. Did you just throw away that scallop? You just threw away the scallop. I'll be real with you. I'm worried that I won't be able to finish. What if this one doesn't get cooked all the way? He just threw the other one away, and we don't have a backup. You don't get an even sear. Start over. Four minutes. Did you just throw away that scallop? He just threw away the scallop. I got to do it again. I am moving faster than the fastest person you've ever seen move fast, because I need to plate this dish. He doesn't have enough time to make it. Butter basting is smart. It's going to cook it fast. It's going to cook it even. It's going to give it a perfect color. Yeah. Just give it some flavor. Since I lost last round, I figured uh, you know, I'll try to make up for it and do it a little bit more complicated stuff. So. This one is definitely the complete opposite of round two. Even though I had a late start, it didn't affect me at all. I'm pushing right up to the wire, and it shouldn't be a problem finishing everything I want it done. One minute left. I finally got a nice sear on my scallop, but now I'm worried I won't be able to plate this dish in time. There's tons of components that all have to get on the plate. And if I don't plate, it's a disqualification. This is coming down to the wire. 30 seconds left. We need to win that. 10 seconds. Get it on the plate, guys. <laughs> I get nervous. Five, four, three, two, one. Step away from the burner. Stop cooking. Yeah. Nice job. Wow, I think they just made it. When I see that we both did a preparation with diver scallops, that starts to worry me. What if his scallop was done better than mine? Chef Cloyce, 
What have you prepared for Chef Chen? I have prepared a deconstructed oyster po' boy with an Old Bay mayo, seafood chowder with clam, shrimp, and bay scallop. And then on your right, it's a seared scallop with cream corn. Thank you, Chef. Chef Andrew, what did you prepare for Chef Jen? I prepared sriracha clams with tempura kimchi, lobster risotto with a butter poached claw, and a pancetta wrapped sea scallop with eggplant ragu. Thank you, Chef. Chefs, please welcome back Chef Jen Carroll. <laughs> welcome back, Chef. As you know, this is a blind taste test, meaning you have no idea who cooked which dish. You're judging the dishes based on creativity, presentation, adherence to the spirit of the challenge, and of course, taste. Chef, please taste the dishes on your right. Chef Jen looks like she's really enjoying it. That makes me feel confident. Not cocky, but confident. The scallop was beautifully cooked and seared, beautifully presented. I love the scallop shell. I liked the sauce with the oyster, and the chowder was super tasty. All of the proteins were cooked really nicely, which is huge. I didn't really think that there was any need for the crouton. You already have breading on the oyster, so I think it was a little superfluous. That's a bummer, because my deconstructed po' boy was probably one of my more creative endeavors. Chef, please try the dish on your left. I think Chef Jen's going to look for the basics first. Is it seasoned well? Is it cooked right? Lobsters look really nice. Is she coming for another bite? That's not good. I'm pretty happy with it. I think it looks good, but I hope I thought it through enough. <laughs> this tempura was awesome. Light, flaky, just perfect, the way tempura really should be. And the broth it tastes like the ocean, not too heavy. I could eat a whole bowl of it. Also, the lobster. I really liked the technique. It looks beautiful, and it was cooked really nicely. Now, the issue that I have, the risotto was definitely overcooked, really thick, gummy. With the pancetta wrapped scallop, the pancetta was not crispy, and the scallop was just overcooked. My worst fears came true. Being wrapped tight just kind of helped keep that residual heat and was enough to push my scallop into the overcooked zone. Now, before we announce the winner of tonight's Man vs. Child, Prodigies, please enter the kitchen. Over the years, I've really been focusing on my shellfish cookery, and to not win, I would go crazy. As fun as it is to come here and cook with everyone, and as honored as I am to be part of this, as sweet as the kids are, I still want to win, <laughs> you know? Well, Chef, who is the winner of tonight's Man vs. Child? My favorite dish is... Congratulations, prodigies. I'm ecstatic. We were able to beat somebody who has so much expertise in this area. What drew you to that dish? It was the scallop. It is just beautifully seared and beautifully cooked. You can come cook seafood at my restaurant any day. Thank you. That's pretty cool. Maybe I should get into seafood. Thank you very much, Chef Jen. Congratulations again, prodigies. And thank you, Chef Drew, for competing today. And we'll see you next time on Man vs. Child. Yeah! Good job. Killed it. There's no bad feelings at all. It was just an honor to see these kids do their thing. You guys are so awesome. You did such a good job. I would totally hire every single one of them. In fact, they'd probably replace me. I'm in awe with all of them. Yay, the prodigies won! <laughs> You're about to witness a culinary revolution. We've gathered America's most talented cooking prodigies to compete against executive chefs with years of training and decades of experience. I don't want to be treated like a kid. I'm a chef. Tonight, fried chicken heavyweight Johnny Zone goes head-to-head -head against the prodigies in three rounds of grueling competition. I want to sweep the rounds. I want to hit him strong. <laughs> At stake, the one tool chefs can't live without, their reputation. I'm very serious about my cooking career. <laughs> I got straight up hustled. Sorry, Chef Johnny. We're going to win. Jeff Johnny and the Prodigies put it all on the line for bragging rights. The experience that I have is going to give me an edge over these kids. It's the superstars of tomorrow. Oh, my heart's racing. Against the titans of today. The stress is real, guys. It's a battle of epic proportions. Oh, my god. And it all starts now on Man vs. Child Chef Showdown.
I'm your host, Adam Gertler, and tonight it's a culinary showdown in three rounds. Our first judge is celebrity chef, cookbook author, and owner of the restaurant group Mike Isabella Concepts, Mike Isabella. Our second judge is co-owner of Tarzan E. Jane and private chef to Hollywood's elite, Alia Zane. Tonight's executive chef competitor has worked with Thomas Keller, Nobu Matsuhisa, and he was part of Gordon Ramsay's team when he opened the Michelin-starred London. Wow. He's famous in Los Angeles for the Nashville hot chicken he serves from his food truck, Howlin' Rays. People know me for fried chicken, but I'm just as comfortable doing a 22-course tasting menu. The experience that I do have, it's gonna give me an edge over these kids. They don't necessarily have the experience that I have. Definitely gonna bring my A game and win this competition. Please welcome. Chef Johnny Zone. Chef Johnny is gonna be a tough competitor today. He has a ton of French training behind him and he works on a food truck where there's not a lot of time or area to work. He's here to compete. We're so happy that you could join us here today. I hope you're ready for some serious competition. Definitely looking forward to it. You'll be competing in three different challenges against the prodigies. And tonight's prodigies, we have Chef Emily. Chef Olivia, yeah. Chef Cloyce, yeah. Chef Isaiah, and yeah. Chef Holden. Yeah. Some people say how we feel is directly related to the foods that we eat. Now, if that's the case, today we'll all be feeling great because today's challenges all revolve around comfort foods. I feel really good about comfort food. and It's something that is threaded throughout a lot of my cooking. I'm definitely confident. I feel like I excel at this. Now, before we get too comfortable, let's find out who you're competing against in round one. Prodigies, who's it gonna be? Chef Johnny's real house is comfort food. We need to really hit him strong, hit him hard, hit him with everything we got. We choose Chef Holden. While Chef Johnny might go in the more classic comfort food route, Chef Holden is really known for making foods a little bit more elevated. He's 15 years old and hosts late night waffle parties in his parents' kitchen. One of the first things I learned to make was comfort foods. It was helping my dad make dinner. That fatty, delicious, creamy everything. That's what I grew up with. Chef Johnny makes fried chicken on his truck every single day, but I think I'm a pretty good match. Please welcome Chef Holden. Chef Holden looks a bit older than some of the other kids up there, so I think they're starting with one of the heavy hitters. I'm sure when I said tonight's theme is comfort food, all of us thought of this dish. Macaroni and cheese. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Mac and cheese is delicious. Everybody loves cheese, even mice. Mac and cheese, great for me. Every single time we have friends or family over, I make a baked mac and cheese. Everyone loves it. It's always oohs, ahs. Judges, any advice? I love macaroni and cheese. I like it nice and oozy, creamy. So this is a perfect way for you guys to really show your techniques. One thing that I would like to see today, take the classic and do a little riff on it, elevate it. The possibilities and the flavor combinations you use are endless. The judges will base their decision on creativity, presentation, adherence to the spirit of the challenge, and of course, taste. Furthermore, the judges will award the winner of this challenge with an advantage from the menu board for the next round. Whoever wins an advantage in this round has an even better chance of keeping that advantage going into the final winner-take-all third round, blind tasted by a master chef. I want to get in my team the menu board. I want to set the tone, get us our first win for the day. All right, chefs, you have 30 minutes to wow the judges with your version of a mac and cheese. And your time starts now. Mac and cheese is really difficult to do in 30 minutes. I'm gonna make a three cheese bacon mac and cheese with a chicharron crust. Slab bacon. Oh, bacon. This oh. is gonna be so good. To elevate my mac and cheese, I'm gonna add bacon. Everything works with bacon. How are you gonna cut that? Strips, lardone? Lardones. A lardone is more of a cube shape, something you can use to render the fat easily and still have that nice bacony flavor. Hey, Chef Johnny, what do you think about doing? Keeping it super traditional, you know? Doing an old school mac and cheese. Well, actually, we'll do a shells and cheese. For this round, I'm gonna be making a shells and cheese gratiné with charred peppers. For four years, I ran a small little French bistro, and shells and cheese was one of the biggest sellers. And I'm not gonna just rely on luxurious ingredients. What I wanna do is rely on technique and execution and work with subtler, homey ingredients. 
What do you guys think? Dude, mac and cheese. Where do you go? I want to see a classic creamy mac and cheese, maybe a nice crust on top. But at the end of the day, it's going to be about cooking the pasta right, and it's going to be getting that perfect consistency in the cheese where it's not mealy. We're going to do traditional bechamel sauce. So we're making a roux here. This is butter, flour. Making a mac and cheese from scratch has its challenges. When I'm making the roux, definitely going to have to pay attention or else it can be grainy. That's a big misstep that a lot of chefs take when they're making mac and cheese. We're going to add infused milk to the roux. We're going to start with an onion peak. Onion peak is traditionally used to flavor the milk that's used for a bechamel. It's literally an onion studded with cloves. It's a really cool old school French technique when making a bechamel. To flavor my bechamel, I'm using nutmeg, garlic, and a bit of sage. So he just poured the bacon fat into a pot, maybe for a roux. I want to render some of the bacon fat to use that as the base of my roux, which turns into the bechamel. This mac and cheese is going to be definitely unique. 20 minutes remaining, 20 minutes left in this round. I want to include charred peppers in the shells and cheese because it's something to me that's comforting when I smell it every time it gets me. I'm charring the pepper for about 15 minutes. I want that smoky, burnt, but still crisp charred pepper. I think that is what we like to call chicharron, which is pork rinds. Exactly. I love chicharrones. Chicharron is pre-fried skin of a pig. People in Mexico, that's their snack. We have potato chips, they have chicharron. We should be like Mexico. I turn it into a fine grain powder, and I'm adding panko. That's gonna be my crust. Panko's like used for like maybe breading on anything as like the crustiness. Yeah, it gives a good texture. Johnny, how you looking over there? Feeling pretty good. 17 minutes left. Ruse on, milk's infusing. Gotta get pasta cooking. I thought the water would come out to a boil a lot faster. I think I made a mistake in grabbing a large pot and putting a lot of water in it. If I don't have boiling water for the pasta, I'm gonna have some big problems. Chefs, 15 minutes left. 15 minutes remain. He's adding the cream mixture. Holden, what did you put into the cream? Can't answer right now. I'm kind of behind on time. All right. That's not good, but OK. I have so much to do. I'm just getting distracted. I need to make sure that this sauce is perfect. As Chef Holden is mixing his bechamel, I notice he's not whisking hard enough. He needs to make sure that he gets out all of the clumps of flour, or his bechamel will taste like flour and ultimately be gritty. Now it's time to add the roux to thicken the infused milk. Sauce is such an important component to mac and cheese. There's so many things that can go wrong, so I'm really taking my time. Now that I have boiling pasta water, I start adding the pasta. I do not want to serve undercooked pasta, but I'm feeling good moving forward. He's got 11 minutes, and he hasn't even started his pasta yet. It's not boiling. I need this to boil like within the next minute. How high is the heat? All the way. Something's wrong. I need that water to boil, or I can't cook my pasta. Chef Holden, how's it going? Um, I'm a bit behind on time, but pretty good so far. So you're going with an orchetti? Ear-shaped pastas? Exactly. Once it gets to a boil, I need to put the pasta in, and at this point, I'm not going to have any time, because that needs to cook for seven minutes. Holden, what if you took a little bit of the water out? You only need to cover the orecchetti that you're going to use. Get rid of half of it. Get it back on, cover it, blast it. I think that that will boil right away, but I'm worried this pasta won't cook thoroughly. All right, good luck, pal. This is the first round. I really need to win this advantage, and I can't let my team down. So I just put it into the pot and hope that it works. Chef Zone. So you're going very classic now. What kind of cheese is going in this? So we're doing a little bit of Gruyere, mozzarella kind of for uh, stringiness, and then we're going to do parm. So it's like three kind of layers of cheese. Now, are you going with any kind of crust or topping, or is it going to be an all creamy? We're going to gratin it with uh, a torch. OK. So just straight torch on. OK, now we have just about eight minutes remaining. You have noodles that still need to finish cooking. Yep. So time is going to definitely be a factor there. Good luck. Thank you. This is a tricky little challenge. I think the chefs underestimated just the difficulty in getting the noodles cooked and everything prepared in the 30 minutes. Chef Zone he wants to do a little uh, gratin to make a crust. Holden at least has the advantage of using the chicharron for a crust, which is already crunchy. I like that. I like that a lot. For my mac and cheese, I'm going to use a three cheese blend. Mozzarella, cheddar, and Gruyere. Chef Holden seems a little flustered today, I'll be honest. Holden, what you doing? I'm accidentally turning the pasta off. Don't do that. That's sort of a crucial element. This is not my best round. It's nowhere near. The jury box is distracting me, and I just need to finish. Chef Holden doesn't look like he has a clear vision of what he's going to do. He's really frantic. Five minutes remain in this mac and cheese challenge. Pasta's about to boil over. It's, it's, it's boiling, over. boiling over. Don't turn the heat down. Just take the lid off for a second. Oh my god, he just turned the water off. Don't do that. I'm just 
completely stressed out about this. We really need that advantage in the next round, and I don't think we're gonna get it. Chefs, five minutes remain in this mac and cheese challenge. It's gonna be down to the wire on this. Time's running out and my pasta is not cooking. It's, it's taking forever. I do not want to serve undercooked pasta. I guess the real secret on this one is, can you cook your pasta in time, right? Holden? Uh, yeah, I'll know that for next time. The stress is real, guys. Oh, my heart's racing. Raw. Oh, no. It's a big problem. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty good for raw pasta, but I'm out of time. So I just put it in and hope the residual heat will cook it to a point where it's slightly edible. Two minutes, two minute warning. And I'm feeling really frantic because I'm trying to cut it as close as possible so the pasta is fully cooked. But I need to put something on the plate. Oh, that was a lot of cheese. I was originally gonna use the cheddar on top for plating, but I don't have enough time to put it in the oven. So I'm just adding it straight into the mac and cheese itself. It's gonna be less luxurious, but he's definitely using good improv skills and he's gonna work around it. I am now on my school's comedy sports team. Doing improv comedy is a lot like cooking. It's all about thinking on your feet. So I just have to make it work. What can I do to get that crust? Wait, what's my favorite tool in the kitchen? You blow torch it! Use the blow torch! Yeah. I get the torch. Just torch the top of my mac and cheese. It should turn out well. Oh my god, 30 seconds. I want a crust on top of the shells and cheese. I'm going to achieve this by torching it with a blowtorch. Oh my god. We're neck and neck. 15 seconds. Two guys with the torch, torching mac and cheese. It's coming down to the wire. It's intense. Three, two, one, step away from the dishes, step away from the burners, extinguish yeah. your torches, walk away. Nice job, Holden. This was in no way an easy round. I pulled out something that looks pretty good to me, but pasta should be al dente, and mine is like snail shells. So, yeah. Look down at my dish. It's not exactly what I was going for, but I know the flavor's there, so who knows what's gonna happen. When I look at Chef Holden's dish, I'm thinking, holy crap. I'm really impressed with this kid. His is like, it's golden, it's got little chicharron on it. I definitely think Chef Holden's looks way better than mine. Chef Holden, please explain your dish. Here I have made for you a three cheese bacon macaroni and cheese with a chicharron crust. The chomping on it's a little hard. Chef Holden, your dish, I really like the flavor of it. The touches that you put on top with the chicharron echo that bacon flavor you had in the bechamel. And the cheeses that you chose balanced with each other. The flavors worked and the textures worked. There were some significant problems with the dish. The biggest one was the sauce itself. You didn't properly cook out the flour, so it was too gritty. Chef Holden, you had a nice presentation, beautiful crust on top. It reminded me of going to a steakhouse and ordering a side of mac and cheese with my steak. I like the smokiness of the bacon. I like the chicharrones. It definitely had some fun stuff going on. Pasta was raw. It was undercooked. It's mac and cheese. The focal point should be macaroni. That did not happen today. I want you tasting more, and I want you focused. It's not a game. It's a competition. You're here to win. My sauce was gritty, and my pasta was raw. Next time when I make mac and cheese, I'm going to make sure I can do it properly. Chef Johnny, please explain your dish. We have a shells and cheese gratiné laced with charred peppers. So much pressure. Chef Johnny, I really liked your sauce. It was very velvety, nice and cheesy, and I really enjoyed the way you roasted your peppers. And the very little delicate touch of the gratin on top helped bring that smokiness out of the peppers. Almost reminded me of like a hot queso. Really enjoyed that. You also had issues with your dish. I know you struggled cooking the pasta. It was a little bit too al dente for me and you didn't put enough pasta into your cheese. I wanted a nice bowl of macaroni, pasta. I didn't get that. I only got a couple shells on the bottom. If I went out to eat and ordered that, I would have asked where the other half of my dish was or I would have sent it back. Ouch. Chef Johnny, I really like the flavor profile that you had in the dish. I liked the different cheeses you chose. The gratin on top was really nice because it added a nice saltiness to the dish. And I too enjoyed the peppers. 
What was lacking in the dish to me was a lack of seasoning. When I just took one bite of the dish, it fell a little bit flat. But when I specifically pulled out the little bit of bell pepper, the pasta, a little bit of the sauce, and the gratiné on top, it really worked. But I kind of had to make my own bites rather than just digging into it to get the right seasonings and textures. I definitely agree with some of these criticisms. The ratio was a little bit off. There wasn't enough shells and cheese in the bowl. I really want to win this first round. I want to come out swinging. I want to set the pace for the rest of the competition. Well, chefs, please give us a moment to discuss your dishes. We both should have cooked our pasta more, but Chef Chani's dish. It's not a lot of mac and cheese. It's maybe four bites. Well, mine is a big plate of mac and cheese. I think I can win this. Chef Holden got criticism for the grittiness of his sauce, and that's one thing that I know that I properly executed, and I feel really good about that. Mike, Alia, who's the winner of round one? The winner is... Chef Johnny. I won this round, feels awesome. Coming out winning, I wanna sweep the rounds. I wanna really hit him strong. Chef Johnny, you won on your sauce. Your sauce was more velvety, more creamy. That's what brought you to the win. I feel bad that I lost round one. And now the next prodigy is going in with a disadvantage. Congratulations, Chef. This means you get to choose an advantage from the menu board for round two. Let's hope you pick the advantage for the dog. And speaking of round two, when I think about my favorite comfort foods, I think Mama Gertler knew best. Her matzo ball soup is a thing to behold. For this challenge, we want you to bring mom's home cooking to the next level and elevate a homemade dish. Mama's home cooking really plays into the comfort food theme. Having a dish that's prepared by your mother, it makes you feel fuzzy inside. Judges, any advice? When I think of good food and I think of comfort food, I think of the food that my grandmother made. Everything's balanced, but the most important thing is that she put so much love into the food. Everything lovingly prepared is what reminds me of my childhood. The key to this challenge is your approach, but I want to see your skills as a chef, I want to see technique, and I want to see finesse. All right, Holden, it's time for you to make your choice. Who's going to compete at a disadvantage in the next round? I choose Chef Olivia. Yeah! Chef Olivia, she learned a lot of her skill from her mom. And I know she loves comfort food. She's definitely the best pick. She's 11 years old and new to Man vs. Child Kitchen. Aside from being a maestro in the kitchen, she's a master of the dance. I grew up cooking with my mom. I know all of her dishes. Chef Johnny did really good in round one, but I feel confident that I'm definitely going to win. Please welcome Chef Olivia. Yeah! Olivia. I'm really surprised that this little teensy tiny kid can cook. I don't want to underestimate her because I know that she's probably got some skills up those little sleeves. In this round, the menu items are... Takeaway. Rob your opponent of a key ingredient. Lifeline. You can ask a judge to provide feedback on one of the components of your dish. Or... Wild card. Take a chance. You could win a massive advantage or be hampered with a disadvantage. I think we're gonna go with takeaway. Takeaway. Yeah. You will be able to rob your opponent of a key ingredient. To that adorable face, you're gonna be able to do that. Takeaway is very serious. If he takes away the ingredient that I need the most, I have to find another way to come up with something. Okay, chefs, there you have it. You have 45 minutes to take a mama's favorite and elevate it. Your time starts now. I have to be really clever if I want to beat Chef Johnny's own. Chef Johnny can't take away my ingredient that I've already used, so I've used all my ingredients as fast as I can. After watching the prodigies in round one, I'm definitely not going to be going easy on them. We're going to do some fried chicken with some basically like braised greens. I'm making fried chicken this round. Um, it's definitely gonna be in my wheelhouse. I mean, I, I serve 200 to 300 pieces a day. I love meatloaf. My mom cooks it a lot. And I mean, why won't the judges like it? 
I'm gonna make a mini meatloaf with some borzon cheese, mashed potatoes, and roasted vegetable gravy. A perfect meatloaf has to be really moist. And also, you have to use some sort of binder. And in this case, she's using breadcrumbs and egg yolk. How are you gonna make your meatloaf different? I used um, pork, veal, and beef. Okay, it's gonna add a more, you know, rich, almost fall apart texture that you want in a good meatloaf. Chef Johnny, what kind of greens are you going with? We're gonna work with kale here, and we're gonna render out bacon fat and then cook the kale down in bacon fat. The main inspiration on this dish is my mom's greens. Normally I'd use collard greens or string beans for this dish, but I'm using kale because it cooks really quickly. This is very low country style of cooking these greens. In this braise, I really want some piggy porcine flavor, some tomato flavor, some salinity from the salted pork. Thank you for the greens. I only have 45 minutes, so I have to make a small meatloaf so it'll cook all the way. It's like a little chubby meatloaf. You see how Olivia is just moving? She's trying to prevent Chef Johnny from using that takeaway. Olivia is super competitive. She's the only girl on her Little League team for two years. I mean, I'm familiar with competing, so I think I can handle takeaway. So let's take away something. What, what do we want? Are you peeling my you prepped everything? Oh, you're smart. You are on top of it. Let's take away the breadcrumbs. It's awesome because I've already used the breadcrumbs in my meatloaf. Works for me. Woo! Woo! He's just clearing my station for me. They're all giggly googly. Turns out I got straight up hustled. Thank you, Chef Johnny. See that face. You can't trust that charming little face. She was very smart for moving very fast in the beginning. Now that my potatoes are on the stove and they're getting to a boil, I have to start doing my gravy. I'm going to use some carrots, some celery, even some mushrooms. And I'm going to let those saute a little bit. And once those are soft, I add some Marcella wine. Flambe! Nice. These, these prodigies are bringing, bringing the heat. Uh, we're building our batter here. The texture I'm looking for on this chicken is shattered glass. I'm looking for it to be crispy, crunchy. I want it to shatter, I want it to crunch. I'm gonna elevate it by uh, real proper execution. It's flour, milk, flour. Hope he seasons this chicken. Olivia, how's it going over here? I'm doing great. Is that Borson? Yes. So that's kind of a cool twist. Borson cheese is delicious. It's like a light, creamy cheese. It's gonna be good. Putting a lot of cheese in there. How's your oven cooking over here? I go to check on my meatloaf, and the temperature is not high enough. It's supposed to be at 350, and it's at like 220. My meatloaf's not. It's not cooking. That's not good. This is the main part of my dish, and I have to nail this, and it's not cooking. I'm just so scared. How's your oven cooking over here? I go to check on my meatloaf, and the temperature is not high enough. This oven is something that I've never worked with before. What do you need? I need the temperature up higher. OK. You've got to click the center button that says bake. There's a little knob. you got to click the knob, pull it over. We have some very high-level professional kitchen equipment in the MVC kitchen. It can be confusing. Uh, 375. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Chef Johnny. Yeah. Woo! The oven's working, but I don't know how my meatloaf's gonna cook in time. That was a really solid move, helping Olivia out with the oven over there. Definitely. You know these kids, they're gonna grow up and they're gonna treat other chefs how they're treated. That was one thing working for Ramsey that I definitely learned. So talk to me about the chicken right here. It's just something that reminds me of home. Well, that's the idea, that is the challenge this round. Good luck. Right now we're gonna do a pickle. I mean, who doesn't like pickles with fried chicken? I need to win this round because it's fried chicken and that's something I'm known for. I don't know if that meatloaf's gonna be done. So, time's almost up. At this point, I'm so worried. Nobody looks raw meatloaf at all. Pull it out, pull it out. Come you on. got a minute 30. I touch it and it's firm. It's cooked nicely. One minute remains, chefs. Going together on the plating, I really want it to be a little messy, a little rustic. I want them using their hands. Fight over who gets the thigh or the drumstick. Five, four, three, Two, one, step away from the burners. <laughs> Olivia seems very pleased. Good job. My meatloaf is cooked. Everything is on point. I'm really confident that I'm gonna win this challenge. 
Definitely my dish. Looks like a winning dish. I mean, that fried chicken, the way it's cooked, the technique is there. Chef Olivia, please explain your dish. Here I prepare for you a mini meatloaf with borzon cheese, mashed potatoes, and some roasted vegetable gravy. Looks very good. Looks like a very well composed dish. Chef Olivia, your plate looked and tasted like home to me. I don't know if this is your mom's recipe or not, but if it is, she's doing a great job. This nailed the essence of the challenge. The nice homey meatloaf, the nice creamy, cheesy potatoes. The one issue I had with the meatloaf is I just think you needed to mix it up a little bit more to get the breadcrumbs and the eggs and everything really incorporated evenly. But overall, a really great dish. Thank you. Chef Olivia, I appreciate that the aesthetic was clean and it was simple and we knew what we were getting into. It was a very good rendition on a classic dish. But while I like the idea of the potatoes, there was too much cheese and they were too salty. Okay. Sometimes people like extra cheesy, but if one thing's messed up, that's the point against you. Chef Johnny, please explain your dish. What you have in front of you is a classic southern fried chicken with braised greens and some pickled cucumber. Fried chicken looks so good. It really just is going to come down to the protein cookery. It's going to come down to all of the accompaniments, and it's going to come down to how comforting their dish is. Chef Johnny, the flavors really worked for me. The chicken itself was really crispy on the outside and cooked perfectly on the inside. Overall, the chicken was amazing, but to me, it was a little clunky to eat in the small little plate. I wish you had had the same components, but plated them a little bit differently. Chef John, when you pulled that chicken out of the fryer, it was like a piece of art. It was juicy, it was crispy, it was golden. It was everything a fried chicken should be. The taste was very hard to eat. It's a very small plate to serve it in. The greens were nice, but under seasoned. The judges didn't understand the family style of my dish. Definitely worried at this point. Please give us a minute to discuss. It would just feel good to win against Chef Johnny Zone because he owns a popular food truck. And if I won, I could probably own that food truck. This round is definitely really important to me. People know me for my fried chicken, and I put a lot of love and care and thought into this dish. So Mike, Alia, who's the winner of round two? We've decided that the winner is... We've decided that the winner is... Chef Olivia. Yeah! I win! I did this. What? I did this. Congratulations, Chef Olivia. For you, Chef Johnny, if there was just a bit more salt, a nicer presentation, could have taken it. Losing this round is definitely some ego damage, but I just want to put my head down and finish strong. Congratulations, prodigies. This means that your team gets to pick an advantage from the menu board going into the third and final winner-take-all round. As always, round three is a trio's round, meaning you will have to create three dishes. This round is to be presented and judged by our master chef in a blind taste test. Our special guest today is a culinary giant. He opened the Foundry on Melrose in 2007 and quickly became known for his elevated take on home cooking. Now with his newest venture, Mare, and Greenspan's grilled cheese, he is truly emerged as a king of comfort food. Please welcome Chef Eric Greenspan. Yeah! Yeah. Eric Greenspan, I don't think there's any comfort food that he doesn't execute well. I've seen him in multiple interviews, cooking shows. He is one of the more specialized comfort food people out there. Heard you guys are throwing a comfort food party. Obviously, I had to crash it. I mean, for years, I've been reworking comfort food and kind of elevating it to a higher level. But there's one thing that is near and dear to everything that I hold holy, and that is obviously the grilled cheese sandwich. Oh! oh. oh. I think this challenge is going to be really cheesy. I love puns. I've been doing grilled cheese sandwiches for a long time. I need to see some creativity. I want bold flavors. I need crispy bread. So don't think that you can put two pieces of bread and cheese together and win this darn thing. I take it seriously. I'm looking forward to you guys to take it really seriously, too. Thank you, Chef Greenspan. We'll call you back just as soon as our chefs have completed their cook. Good luck, guys. Look forward to tasting, all right? All right, Olivia, it's time for the big question. Which one of your teammates is going to make a good grilled cheese for the third round? I choose Chef Cloy. I think Chef Cloy is perfect for this round because he always goes out of the box. He's going to be able to come up with something really great and big and bold. This chef is a fan favorite. 
He's not only brains, but also brawn. Yes, I get to cook for Eric Greenspan, and I'm excited. It's important for me to win this challenge because Eric Greenspan is somebody that I've been looking up to for quite a long time, and he's got such expertise. Having Eric Greenspan pick my trio would be something special. Please welcome Chef Cloyce. Me. Standing next to Chef Cloyce, the vibe's definitely a little intense. I know he's ready to roll. In this round, the menu items are... Simon says, pick up the two techniques that your opponent must use to create the dish. Me's my place. Have your opponent prepare a set of mise en place tasks to judge Mike Isabella's satisfaction for your own use. Sue me. You will be provided with an executive level chef to play your sue. Chef Cloyce. What will it be? I think I'm gonna go with Sumi. I'm not too sure about Chef Cloyce's decision. It might be too many hands in the pot. Please welcome Man vs. Child's very own Chef Jamie Lawrence. Yeah! Okay, chefs, it all comes down to this. You have one hour to create a grilled cheese trio. To win, you'll have to go all out. <sighs> Your time starts now. Grilled cheese seems deceptively simple, but Chef Greenspan said he doesn't want it simple. It would be nice to see three different types of bread, three different types of cheeses, but also ingredients that pair well with those cheeses and that bread. My wife makes the best grilled cheeses I have ever had. This is for her. She's trained me on grilled cheese. She would be completely pissed if I didn't impress Chef Eric Greenspan. The first grilled cheese I'm gonna make is a traditional white bread cheddar. The second grilled cheese, I'm gonna make a three cheese grilled cheese on sourdough. The third grilled cheese is a German-inspired pretzel grilled cheese with salt-rubbed cabbage and black forest ham. The stakes here are very high. If I lose this round, I'm sleeping on the couch for probably 20 days. All right, let's get some smoked gouda. Let's get to Leggio. For my trio, I'm going to make a pimento grilled cheese with crispy bacon on rye bread, a braised short rib with Taleggio, mozzarella, and gruyere, and a dried fruit chutney with mozzarella and gruyere on sourdough, all served with house pickled veg. Can you start on a pickling liquid for me? Dill, let's do mustard seed. I'm pickling these vegetables because that extra acidity will help to counterbalance all of the rich fattiness of my grilled cheeses. I'm making a seasoned aromatic butter with thyme, crushed garlic, a little bit of sea salt. I'm going to coat the bread in that aromatic butter before it's cooked. I am getting some short rib started. Normally, it would take about four and a half to five hours to perfectly braise the short rib. The pressure cooker allows me to braise very tough meats in 30 minutes. Each of these grilled cheeses that I'm gonna make, I want to have a dipping sauce. First, I'm making a tomato and beef broth that's gonna go with my traditional grilled cheese. I wanna make a buttermilk ranch sauce for this sourdough grilled cheese. I really want this to be herbaceous and kinda cleanse the palate in between this flight of grilled cheeses. I'm also making a mustard sauce to go with this pretzel grilled cheese that's gonna be laced with black forest ham. That's a great idea, having yeah. dipping sauces for the grilled cheese. Oof, he's on a mission to win this one. What are we doing with this dried fruit? Let's go ahead and make a chutney. My fruit chutney, it's got a slight sweetness, but still sour and tang. And I think it's gonna go really well with almost a stinkier cheese like Gruyere. Tap fig, cherries we can leave whole. Cloyce has recently started attending culinary school. I feel like you can see a lot of what he's already begun learning. I'm very serious about my cooking career. It's not just about A's anymore. It's about getting 100% and performing at a really high level. <sighs> Smells good. I'm making a salt scrubbed cabbage that's gonna go with my German inspired grilled cheese. We're gonna cook the cabbage by seasoning it with salt and sugar. What you'll notice is it breaks down like a sauerkraut, if you will. What are you working on? I'm uh, gonna do a little pimento cheese. You're gonna make pimento cheese? I am. I love pimento cheese. Pimento cheese is like a cheese blend, so it has a nice sweetness, and it's usually a little bit spicy. And I think that creamy richness going along with my nice crispy bacon is gonna add a nice textural element. Hey, Chef Boyce, what's in your stand mixer? Cheddar, gouda, and a little cream cheese. To that, I'm gonna add piquillo peppers. Pimento grilled cheese shows great technical skill, which is definitely something Eric Greenspan will be looking for. Now it's time to put together this German-inspired grilled cheese. 
I take the pretzel roll, a little mustard spread. I'm adding ham, I'm adding cabbage, and I'm adding Swiss cheese to this grilled cheese sandwich. Next one's gonna be your classic cheddar and tomato. You can't go wrong with that. Sounds really good, but a little traditional. So Chef Johnny is serving a classic grilled cheese with like just cheese and bread. What? This is a competition. Sorry, Chef Johnny, we're gonna win. How's it going, chefs? Pretty good. Tell me about what's going on in the pressure cooker. Short rib. Okay. It's gonna go with Taleggio, mozzarella, and Gruyere. Do you seem to be using that sous me advantage to your advantage by doing things that have a lot of components? Yes, it would be bad to pick sumi and then go with something simple. Good luck to you both. I'm trying to go very ambitious. I'm trying to do as much as I can in the time allotted. Short ribs are good. Oh, that's nice. It's very important to impress Eric Greenspan. It would be amazing if he chooses my trio. Hey, Chef Johnny. What is your secret to success in this round? Just keep it super simple. Really, really crunchy bread. And here's a secret, too, that I like. See, that's cheese right there. Yeah. Purposefully putting the cheese over that edge. This round, I'm cooking for a grilled cheese master, so I'm really paying attention to the technique. But you need the crispy bread, you need the oozy cheese. Very exciting, good luck. These simple little details often get overlooked, and that's something this round that I really want to pay attention to. 15 minutes left. We're gonna do all of these open face until we combine them at the end. So all open face and they go in the oven to melt? Yes. All right, let's get going. I begin to toast my bread. I need this cheese to melt. It is the most important aspect of this entire grilled cheese. 10 minutes remain in this round. The last sandwich now is gonna be this sourdough grilled cheese with the mozzarella, the brie cheese, and a little bit of that smoked gouda. Once all of my breads are toasted, with four minutes on the clock, I put them into the oven to make sure that all of the cheeses melt properly. Now I'm playing the waiting game. He's gonna have to take it out and push the short rib in, assemble everything, and that alone will be cutting it close. Right as this comes out, that's on the pimento in here. That goes on. Time is dripping off the clock. We really need the cheese to be melted. It's not a grilled cheese without melty cheese. Yeah, <sighs> I'm cutting it close. Time is dripping off the clock. It's not a grilled cheese without melty cheese. Yeah. Uh, I'm cutting it close. All right, I'm gonna pull it. The cheeses aren't gonna melt in time, so I begin to blow torch my grilled cheeses. Oh, he's going torch to finish melting. Two minutes remaining. I look over at Chef Place and I'm feeling good. He has two chefs and he puts up three grilled cheeses with pickles and I have three grilled cheeses and dipping sauces. Five, four, three, two, one, stop grilling cheeses. Yeah. Good job, Chef Johnny, good job, Chef hey. Boyce. I definitely made an elevated take on three very distinct types of grilled cheeses, so now it just comes down to Chef Greenspan's opinion. Chef Cloyce, what have you prepared for Chef Greenspan today? So I have prepared a pimento grilled cheese with crispy bacon, a short rib grilled cheese with Taleggio, mozzarella, and Gruyere. And then the last one is a dried fruit chutney grilled cheese with Gruyere and mozzarella and house pickles. Thank you, Chef. Chef Johnny, what have you prepared for Chef Greenspan? Today I prepared a classic grilled cheese with a tomato broth. We got a three cheese on sourdough with buttermilk ranch inspired sauce. On the end there, we got a German inspired cabbage black forest ham with mustard ham sauce. Thank you, chef. Chefs, please welcome back our round three guest judge and master chef, Eric Greenspan. Woo! Yeah. Woo! Look at this. So this is a blind taste test, chef, meaning you have no idea who cooked which dish. Now remember, these dishes are to be evaluated on presentation, creativity, adherence to the spirit of the challenge, and of course, taste. Chef, please try the dish on your right. I see Chef Greenspan feel my bread to test for toastiness. Maybe I didn't toast long enough, or my toasting wasn't even, but this is definitely something I could throw this whole situation into the trash can. This entire trio is restaurant ready. There's a lot of sophistication going on on the inside of these sandwiches, but there's an overarching sweetness. And also, and this is kind of a big one, the bread. Parts of it are crispy, parts of it not so much. 
However, the flavors were amazing. So fantastic, fantastic effort. I know for a fact that I can toast bread perfectly. It's not putting my best foot forward, giving him bread that wasn't perfect. And now for the dish on your left. I'm standing probably about 15 feet away from him, and I can still hear that crunch of the bread. And I'm feeling pretty good. My knocks would be a little bit of a level of simplicity. At the same time, talking about simplicity, and somebody had the chutzpah to just go cheddar cheese, white bread, done. And then I love the attempt at the dips, as if it's not enough pressure to make three grilled cheese sandwiches. But most importantly, the bread is crispy. Even though Chef Greenspan says it's pretty simple, the fact is I spent an hour making three grilled cheeses. Execution, the technique, you know, it's really spot on. So I'm feeling really good. Now, before we announce the winner of tonight's Man vs. Child Chef Showdown, prodigies, please enter the kitchen. I'm still feeling pretty confident because Chef Cloyce got criticism for the bread not being crispy enough, and that's one of the main components to a really good grilled cheese. Chef Greenspan, oh, you prince of provolone, who is the winner of tonight's Man vs. Child Chef Showdown? All six sandwiches were phenomenal. But at the end of the day, if I had to choose, the winner would be this one. I win and I feel great. Nice job. It's definitely an important message for a lot of chefs to not overlook the simpler things. You want to pay attention to the basics. Chef Greenspan, in the end, what put it over the top for you? A little bit of technique when it comes to the crispiness of the bread and creating three singular sandwiches with their own voice. But the fact that you guys came up with something this sophisticated and you have this command of flavor and technique is super scary, because it means I'll probably be out of a job real soon. Chef Johnny was a very good chef. I'm happy that I lost to someone who's as skilled as he is. Well, thank you very much, Chef. My absolute pleasure, thank you. Congratulations, Chef Johnny, and we'll see you next time on Man vs. Child, Chef Showdown. Seeing these kids, I have a lot of faith in the future of cooking, and it's very inspiring to see that. about to witness a culinary revolution. Tonight, five of the most talented cooking prodigies in the world go head to head in three rounds against executive chefs with years of training and decades of experience. There's no way I'm going down. I don't want to be treated like a kid. I'm a chef. Cooking is a science. You just can't underestimate these kids. I'm going to crush that competition. With our final round, judged by the world's most critically acclaimed chefs, and winner takes all, blind taste test. It's the superstars of tomorrow. Way to get in his head. Against the titans of today. Coming down to the wire. I want to show the world that kids can take down executive chefs. This is cutting it so <laughs> close. This is Man vs. Child, Chef Showdown. I'm your host, Adam Gertler, and this week it's a culinary showdown in three rounds. Our first judge is an entrepreneur to the core. He's chef and co-owner of several restaurants, including Graffiato and Kopnos, celebrity chef Mike Isabella. Our second judge is a butcher and private chef to Hollywood A-listers, Ali Azain. Our challenger today, he's the corporate consultant chef for the House of On. He oversees five restaurants, including Crustacean in Beverly Hills. I started cooking for my family when I was in preschool. I still think I'm a prodigy. I've been cooking professionally since I've been 16 years old. I have a lot of responsibilities, so I think I'm going to mop the floor with the kids. Please welcome Chef Tony Gwen. Oh my gosh, she's young. I thought Chef Tony, he was gonna be like higher 30s or lower 40s somewhere. But when I find out that he's 26, 27, I'm getting less nervous. Welcome, Chef Tony. Thank you. Our prodigies will determine Chef Tony's competition in each round. Okay, prodigies, who's it gonna be? Right, okay, we need someone so that's flexible. Someone. Chef Tony came to compete, so we need someone who can move quickly. Okay. We choose 
Chef Dylan. <laughs> Chef Dylan is one of our younger chefs, but he's also a heavy hitter. So this is gonna be an interesting challenge. He's 12 years old and has been cooking family meals since he was four. I usually cook dinner for the family. I just really wanna show people that I wanna cook for them. I just wanna make them happy. All of our years of experience combined together, we have more years than he's been alive. That gives us a big advantage. Please welcome Chef Dylan. You got this, Dylan. My first impression of Chef Dylan is he's really goofy. Right away, I feel like I won round one. Welcome to round one, chefs. For this challenge, you'll be working with one of America's favorite ingredients. In fact, Americans consume 30 billion tons of these every year. Potatoes. See, is right, potatoes. But this isn't just any old potato challenge. This is Freaky Friday. We want you to select from this potato cornucopia and make for us a French fry worthy of a win. I've eaten many French fries in my life. I've eaten more French fries than Dylan. Judges. Any advice? You know, the potato's really versatile. The choice of potato will determine texture and flavor. Be creative. For something so simple, you really want to let your imaginations run wild. And the flavors in your dipping sauce should complement the simplicity of this dish. The judge's critique is based on creativity, presentation, adherence to the spirit of the challenge, and of course, taste. Now remember, they will also allow the chef with the best dish to choose an advantage from our menu. As always, Whoever scores the advantage this round has a better chance of keeping the advantage for the all-important winner-takes-all third round. Chefs, please take to the burners and prepare to begin your first cook. You have 30 minutes to take these spuds and make them scrumptious. And your time starts now. Out the gate. He's making a lot of french fries. I grab the russet potatoes. I also grab sweet potatoes to put in my sauce. I hope I get bonus points for using more than one potato. What are the most important things to do to allow for that great french fry texture? It's definitely gonna come down to how they cut the potato. Mm -hmm. In 30 minutes, you don't have a lot of time to do a bigger french fry. I would be surprised if they could do like a bigger potato and make it nice and crispy. I'm personally a fan of wedge cut steak fries. I make fries at home all the time, mostly steak fries. I'm in my comfort zone, I've got this. My mom and my grandma, they really inspired me to cook. And cooking is definitely it's not the thing I do every day, so I have a lot of experience. Chef Tony has been cooking for about 10 years. I've been cooking for about seven. I can take this guy down. I'm cutting batons of russet potatoes. Thick enough to hold a shape, but not too thick to be too potato-y. You want to first blanch them so they're soft on the inside and crispy on the outside. I'm making a twice-cooked french fry. I need two fryers so I can soften them in the middle and then wait till the last minute to drop them in the hotter oil to give it a crispy exterior. I'm getting a little nervous. Chef Dylan has some really largely cut potatoes working. It looks like he's going for the wedge cut. Yummy! And the skin is some of one of the best parts. I'm planning on making skin on wedge cut garlic fries with a ginger infused malt vinegar and a curry mayonnaise. Fries, they're fries. But I feel I can take them to the next level with multiple dipping sauces. It will show my creativity and it's gonna make a huge impact on my fries and how they taste. Dylan, Dylan. Yeah? Make sure you turn your fryer on. It's already on, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got a little banter going on already. The prodigies do not intimidate me at all. I do not think Dylan stands a chance. Chef Tony, what are you working on? I'm working on a, a play on breakfast with bacon, potatoes, and eggs, and I'm working on a sauce made out of sweet potatoes. A sauce made out of sweet potatoes, brilliant. I gotta say, Dylan might be in trouble in this round. At the end of the day, it's about a fried potato, yeah. not about a potato sauce. So it could be a lot yeah. going on on Chef Tony's side. I hope the fries are the star of the show. I'm very versatile in different cuisines. You know, I was classically French trained. My last job was with the East Mediterranean chef. I just think it's very important to always have a variety of cooking styles and cuisines. Chefs, 20 minutes left. If you feel like you're running out of time, you just have to fry harder. Ah. I'm gonna blanch the fries in my boiling water for about five minutes just until they get soft, because if I stick them right in the fryer, it will only make it crispy on the outside. That's a problem I don't want. 
Is there a difference between blanching in water versus oil? When you blanch it in oil, you're going to slowly cook some of the liquids out, and the potatoes going to become nice and soft textured. So when you chill it and you put it back into the fry, it's going to crisp up very quickly. Right. If you blanch it in water, the potato's going to actually absorb water, so it's not going to get as crispy when you fry it. When you do it in water, the potatoes do get waterlogged. I would have done the same thing that Chef Tony did. Shoot, do not fall. Don't you dare fall. So I take my blanching potatoes out of the boiling water, and I'm gonna set them on a sheet tray, and I'm gonna pop that in the fridge, because I really wanna make sure there's no water on these fries. Chefs, 15 minutes, halfway through round one. Dylan, how are we doing? Excellent. What's the most difficult part of making fries? Um, probably the texture of the skin. You don't, you don't want, like, overcooked fries. Talk to me about this uh, infusion here. Um, this is the ginger-infused malt vinegar sauce. Malt vinegar on fries is very popular in England. The idea of uh, infusing the vinegar is pretty cool. Are you confident you're going to win this challenge? Very confident. What do you think about what your competitors have has going on this round? He doesn't look so tough. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, ever the fierce competitor, Dylan. He's so young. I mean, I feel we have about as much experience as him. What could go wrong? Chef Tony, how are we doing? Doing great. Talk to me about breakfast. It's my favorite meal of the day. So I'm going to do some bacon, eggs, and potatoes. Breakfast is very comforting. I think that potatoes are very comforting. Eggs are very comforting. All of these should go together well. Breakfast and uh, sweet potato sauce. Added really chunky sweet potatoes, almost raw, mm -hmm. instead of just mushing it down and not recognizing what it was. And I just threw it in into the, uh, a little aioli. All right, excellent. Good luck. Thank you, sir. It's finally time to fry the French fries. I also throw in some rosemary and garlic in there to help infuse the oil. What the? Oh, no. OK. So don't you keep those fries in as long as you can, get them nice and crispy. Pull all that liquid out of it, pull that moisture. Yeah, you really want to like cook them long enough in the oil so that, that all that water does come out and they're not soggy. Oh, my god. He just, he just, oh, my god. Dylan keeps lifting up his fire basket, and his french fries aren't going to get crispy if he keeps doing that. This could cost us the win. The problem with steak fries is they're big, and fries have to be crispy. You can't have them just mushy fry that's flopping over, especially steak fries. My fries look a little bit soggy, which I'm a little bit nervous about. This could lead to us losing today. My fries look a little bit soggy, which I'm a little bit nervous about. Are they cooked? Guess not. Dylan is taking the fryer basket out with the french fries in it and putting it back in. And with that constant movement, they're not going to be done in time. I want them to be crispy on the outside, but when you dig into the inside, you know, take the bite, you have the creaminess in the inside. I had a little bit of a struggle with the fryer. My fries are not coming out crispy, but I'm planning on keeping them in there for about five minutes. These are garlic fries, so I'm making kind of like a garlic sauce that's going to go on top of them. And then I'm going to pour that over the fries and chop up some parsley and pour that on top and then toss that together, and that's going to really make start up the show, garlic fries. I'm making a twice cooked french fry, and I'm using breakfast as an inspiration. I'm going to have eggs and bacon and potatoes. Fry the egg at the very last second and use the bacon grease to coat and baste the egg. The egg is going to be really delicious with the bacon fat. It's smelling phenomenal. That's a nice fried egg. His fries look like they're perfectly golden brown. So I take my fries out of the fryer. To the eye, it looks really good. You got this, Dylan. Ooh, he salted them immediately after it comes out of the fryer. Yes, because it's like so The excess oil thin. will soak in with the salt. Chefs, you're coming into the final minute. Get it done, get it together. I'm plating as fast as I can. 30 minutes flew by. I can't believe I only have a few seconds left. I have to get everything plated. I can't fail. I'm really confident about these fries. I really hope I win this round, because my next teammate will go up with an advantage. Five, four, three, two, one. Step away from the plate, Chef. Time's up. I take a step back. I hope the judges get excited about two types of potatoes. I think all of my experience is going to help me win this competition. I'm not afraid of any of the prodigies. OK, chefs, please bring your plates up to the judges. I look over, and I don't see his fries. I see the bacon, I see the eggs. I think I have a big advantage because my fries are the star of the show. Chef Dylan, please explain your dish. I made skin-on wedge-cut garlic fries with a curry mayonnaise and a ginger-infused malt vinegar sauce. I'm really excited to taste these. And I like the presentation of your dish. It's definitely French fry forward. I know what I'm about to get into. 
can't really tell if Mike and Alia like it, you know, I'm seeing them tasting it, they're not really smiling, and I'm getting a little bit nervous. Chef Dylan, I really like the flavors that you achieved in your dipping sauces. I thought that was really lovely, balanced with the nice sweetness and kind of caramelization that you got with the potatoes. One thing I have to say is you definitely have the inside, it's nice and soft and creamy, but unfortunately, the outside didn't get that crispiness that I was expecting. This whole entire time, I really want my fries to be crispy enough. Inside of my head, it was just like, Ugh, are you serious? So Chef Dylan, I definitely think you should have kept it in the fryer longer. You were kind of playing with the fries, pulling them out, looking at them. Leave it alone. Once you start pulling them in and out, you're actually slowing the cooking process down. Yeah. I like the way you cut them. I like the sauté garlic and the parsley. And I really like the ginger malt vinegar. So all together, I thought it was a very good dish. Thank you. Chef Tony, please explain your dish. I made a twice cooked French fry with a sweet potato aioli. And there's also a little white cheddar and bacon with a brown butter and bacon basted egg. Definitely looks like it's gonna be a nice, messy, hearty eating, and hitting the diner late at night for some disco fries. I wish I could've gave you a beer with it. <laughs> I like how much thought you put into the presentation of your dish. I can see all the elements. I like the different layers of sauce you have. I'm excited to dig in. Nice egg. Just use your hands, Alia. <laughs> Alia's eating it for a while. She keeps coming back for more. I think I have this challenge in the bag. Chef Tony, I think you balanced everything really well. You had some pretty rich elements. Really, really liked how everything came together and was very well balanced as far as flavors. Thank you. I know that you were going for the texture. You wanted a little bit undercooked potato to allow different textures in, in the sauce itself. I don't think it quite worked because I got a, a bite and there was a, a big piece of the slightly undercooked potato. That's what I would change on your dish, just like really tightening up the texture on that potato. Thank you. Chef Tony, it was a very ambitious dish. You had a lot of layers of flavor throughout from the bottom to the top. And really, with all the moistures from the aioli, from the egg, from the heats, from the non-heats, everything became almost one texture. There was no crispiness to it. It was very one-dimensional. And I didn't get my fry that I was hoping for. Yeah, Chef. Chef Mike is correct. I wish I could have made the fries a little bit more crispy. I should have left them in the fryer a little longer. Well, chefs, you guys have given us two spectacular dishes. So give us a moment when we uh, make our decision. I'm feeling very nervous right now. At this point, it could be anybody's game. This could be tight. I'm thinking, oh, did the judges say that you're not doing enough? You kind of psych yourself out. At least I do. <laughs> this is gonna be a close one, and that's making me get extremely nervous. It's really gonna come down to absolute flavor, and hopefully it comes our way. Well, Mike, Alia, who gets to pick an advantage from the menu for the next round? Chefs, I gotta say, this is the closest competition in Man vs. Child's history. Seriously, chefs, this took a lot of talking to figure out. We've decided that the advantage goes to... Yeah. We've decided that the advantage goes to... Yeah. Chef Tony. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. This was a really close call. Chef Dylan, the cuts were there, the flavor was there, but the exterior of the fry itself was not crispy. And Chef Tony, the flavors in your dish were amazing. I feel like I'm letting my team down by losing because we really need an advantage in the next round. Well done, Chef Tony. Thank you. This means that you enter into round two with control of the menu board. But before we get to that, I bet you're both wondering what round two is all about. You know, french fries are great, but I know how to make french fries even better. A milkshake. Mike, Alia? Ooh, hamburger. Are those real? Because I want to eat them. <laughs> there is nothing more satisfying than this mouth-watering American staple. Does it get better than burgers? You know, burgers have evolved from the traditional roots, but I want you guys to wow us. Show us what twist you can add to this American classic. I'm really nervous about this challenge. I'm a fine dining chef. I don't cook a lot of burgers. OK, Chef Dylan, that was a valiant effort. Thank you. But it's time now for the big question. Which one of your teammates will compete at a disadvantage in round two? I always get the disadvantage. I choose Chef Cloyce. Cloyce. But I think Chef Cloyce is the one who can overcome the disadvantage and pick us up after this. Chef Cloyce, enter the kitchen. He's 14 years old and grew up watching cooking shows. He's heavily influenced by burger master chef Bobby Flay. My mom used to put on broad spectrum of different cooking shows, and that was how she would calm us down before going to bed. There's so many different chefs that inspired my cooking career. Bobby Flay is definitely up there. 
and I am just pumped up, ready to go. Please welcome Chef Cloyce. Chef Cloyce seems very focused and confident. He's going to be tough to beat. In this round, the menu items are check your work. Your opponent cannot start cooking until a set of mise en place tasks are completed to Chef Isabella's satisfaction. Station vacation. Force your opponent to stop working at any point for five minutes. Kitchen strip. Make your opponent cook with a limited supply of equipment and appliances. Oh, these are bad. All right, Chef Tony, time for you to make your choice. Which one of your menu items do you select? I'll go with kitchen strip. Kitchen stripped. So my disadvantage is kitchen stripped, which means I can only use one burner at a time. OK, chefs, take to the burners and prepare to begin your cook. I mean, I can't cook different things at the same time, so this disadvantage could come back to um, really hurt me in the end. Remember, chefs, you have 45 minutes to build a better burger. And your time starts now. You got this, boys. I mean, this is another great matchup here, Chef Tony. He's coming in with an advantage in this round. Chef Cloyce is really going to have to work hard to catch up. He is operating at a disadvantage. Come on, seriously. Yeah, I mean, he's got to get his jersey on. I mean, his meat is going to be critical. OK, is that chicken? Wait, he's making a chicken burger? For this challenge, I'm going to make a tandoori chicken burger with a dill yogurt. I want to go outside of the box. I want to do something that the judges have definitely not tasted before. Chicken has to be fully, fully cooked. Fully cooked, yes. Yeah, chicken's definitely a ballsy move. Is a reason why you don't see chicken burgers a lot. Chicken is uh, definitely a risk, but I work very well under pressure. If Chef Cloyce is able to pull off a fantastic chicken burger, points for that, right? Yeah. Definite points for that. I'm inspired by Vietnamese food because I am Vietnamese. So I know off the bat I want to make a banh mi burger. I'm going to use pork. Bun mi is a classic Vietnamese sandwich. It has many components, sweet, salty, umami. It has everything. I decided to add some mushrooms. I want to add more contrast and flavor to the burger. And who doesn't love mushrooms on their burger? The smoking gun. To start smoking my mushrooms, I add apple wood, and then I torch the smoking gun. I love blue torches. I love seeing albacore with them. I was only allowed to use the blowtorch once I was 10. <laughs> For my sauces, I'm going to be making a tandoori marinade to go on top of the chicken burger while it's cooking. And then I'm going to be making a dill yogurt. How's it going, Cloyce? Pretty good. How's it going with you? Good. So we're going chicken burger? Now, what kind of bun are you going with? I'm going to do naan in the spirit of the uh, Indian flavors. How are you dealing with the challenge of one burner? actually hasn't affected me very much so far. Beautiful. All right, well, it definitely looks like you've got a different kind of burger. You have 19 minutes left. Thank you. Chef Tony, how are you? Doing well. What's going on with the steam technique? Well, on Sunday mornings, sometimes my father makes for me a ground meatball called a shu mai, and that's ground pork, and sure. he steams it. So it's almost the purest form of pork, mm -hmm. and all you taste is the pork. I want the pork to shine. Beautiful. All right, that sounds great. Very excited to see it. He's putting the burger on, and there's, ooh, my sizzle. there's the sizzle. The yogurt that he's brushing on is going to caramelize as he cooks it on the grill pan. And who knows, it might make some moisture. OK, he's flipping it again just so he can get the caramelization on the yogurt. Yeah. Ooh. Chefs, 10 minutes left. 10 minutes left in the burger challenge. I'm taking a huge risk by steaming my burger. The judges are going to expect a nice grill marks, but by steaming the pork burgers, it's going to come out so moist they won't even notice. I have grill marks on both sides, but I don't think it's going to cook fast enough without the outside burning, so I throw it in the oven to finish cooking. Come on, burger, cook. I decided last minute to add a thin slice of pineapple to my burger. The bun mi is very acidic currently. I think the pineapple is going to add sweetness to it. I'm not a big fan of, of raw fruits on savory meats. Yeah. Five minutes, chefs. Five minutes. Yeah. I check on my burger. I'm feeling it. I don't think it's cooked all the way. I'm going to put it in for one more minute. 
So I put it back in, but I'm starting to get a little nervous on time. You know, when you're cooking something every day, you, you can actually touch that piece of meat and know wh where it's at. Right. And that becomes the experience factor from the prodigy to the chef. The chef has been cooking for years. Yeah, they're really lacking that repetition that will give them the confidence to not have to, like, keep futzing with different ingredients. Get it later! Time is winding down, and I'm starting to assemble my burger. Chefs, two minutes! The burger looks beautiful. I couldn't be happier. I have this one in the bag. He's got this. I mean, he's got this. He's got this. I'm gonna let it cook for the rest. Just cause I don't want them to say that it's undercooked. Just putting it back oh, in the oven. What? A minute 30. Take it out of the oven. Oh no, my God. it has to be fully cooked. It's better for it to be dry than it is for it to be raw. Ooh. I feel you nervous for him. I don't like dry chicken or undercooked chicken. Got to be perfect. We're in the final minute, chefs. Boys, get it on the plate. Get it on the plate. OK, OK, OK. We don't even know if this chicken is cooked. Boys, you got to cook your chicken, man. No, 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 no. Oh, no, my no, God. Wait, wait, wait. Chef Cloyce, yeah, yeah. if, it's, if it's over, he's done. If it's undercooked, he's done. Everything needs to be on point. I think it's cooked. I, I hope it's cooked. 14, 13. Just to be safe, I'm not going to cut the patty. I'm going to let it cook internally for a little longer while I plate. And five, four, four three, three, two, two one. one. Please step yeah. away from the plate, yeah. Chef. I barely got my dish plated in time. It looks a little messy. I mean, I don't know if my chicken's cooked. This is a recipe for disaster. OK, chefs, please bring your plates up to the judges. I look at Chef Cloyce's burger, and I think it's still raw because it had no color on it. Serving a raw burger to the judges should automatically be disqualified. Chef Cloyce, please explain your dish. I have prepared for you a tandoori chicken burger. Chef Cloyce, as far as looking at the dish, I can see that there's a lot of layers of flavor that you have here. You've got the tandoori spice glazed into the patty. You've got the nice, like, creamy yogurt sauce going with it. Presentation, I expect a little more from you, but I'm excited about the flavors. All right, let's taste Chef Cloyce's dish. All right, I'm scared. Please be cooked. You looked like you nailed the chicken. You can take a first bite. <laughs> you know, I feel great. They tell me that the chicken's cooked properly. And I'm like, whoa, hey, that's pretty good. That looks like a good burger. You know, Chef Cloyce, I was a little nervous about taking a bite into it. It was actually cooked perfect. The presentation, definitely not one of your best, maybe one of your worst. But overall, it was one of the best chicken burgers I've ever had in my life. Whoa. All the garnishes, the marinated of the yogurt with the tandoori, the herbs inside, the, the burger what was an awesome burger. Thank you. They haven't tasted Chef Tony's dish yet, but they seem to be liking my dish flavor-wise so far, so I'm starting to feel a little better than I did. Chef Tony, please explain your dish. I have a steamed pork bun mi with kimchi aioli. Chef Tony, your presentation is very beautiful. I like how straightforward it is. I like that you can see the different components. You got a lot of colors. You got a lot of textures going on. You really knocked it out of the park. Thank you. Mm. <sighs> Chef Tony, everything you had going on was very, very flavorful. Um, there were a lot of textures going on, a lot of sweetness, a lot of acidity. I think it was very, very well balanced. My critique would be that it was a little difficult to eat. When we bit into it, the bread kind of fell apart, and a lot of the garnish started falling out, so it became tough to eat. Pineapple I wasn't crazy about, but the beauty, all the different flavors, the smoked mushrooms, the charred onions, overall, I thought it was a great dish. Thank you. Both of you chefs put up two great dishes and went head-to-head -head on this, so give us a little time to come up with an answer. Chef Tony definitely beat me with presentation, but I'm gonna get lots of kudos for cooking a chicken burger properly. And I gotta win this round so I can send whoever gets sent into the third round with an advantage because round three is the most important round because it's the winner takes all round. At this point, it could be anybody's game, but I'm never gonna hear the end of this if I lose to Chef Voice. Well, Mike, Alia, who gets to pick an advantage from the menu for the next round? Once again, in the second round, it was a very tight, decision between both of you guys. Well, we've decided to give the advantage to... We've decided to give the advantage to... 
Chef Cloyce. Job. <laughs> when it's announced that I've won my challenge, it makes me feel great. I know that my team is going to go into the next round with control of the menu board, and this could be another win for the prodigies. Well done, Chef Cloyce. Whoever you select will either get to choose an advantage for themselves, or they may hamper Chef Tony with a disadvantage. As always, the third and final round is a trios challenge, meaning each chef will have to create three different dishes. But before we get to that, I'd like to present our master level chef to introduce and blind taste round three. She's executive chef owner of South Bay's most popular beach hotspots, including Hudson House, Triple, and most recently, Playa Provisions. Wow. Please welcome Chef Brooke Williams. <laughs> welcome, Chef. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. For the final round, Chef Brooke Williamson is in the house. Whoa. Welcome to the Man vs. Child Kitchen. Thanks, Adam. Great to be here. Chef, please tell us, what is our round three trio? Growing up in California, it's always summer. And I'm lucky enough to have been able to spend a lot of time on our great beaches and boardwalks. And when I think of fun food and boardwalks, I think of fair food. There you have it. A fair food trio it is. Pretty whimsical. I love going to the fair. There's all sorts of cute animals and fun, fun games and really cool rides. Chef, thank you for your help in presenting round three. We'll call you in as soon as our chefs have completed the task. Best of luck, chefs. Time now for the big question, Clois. Which one of your remaining teammates will compete with control of the menu board in the third and final round? I choose Chef Holden. Chef Holden, enter the kitchen. Good Holden's the right pick for the Fair Foods Challenge because I mean, we're teenage boys. We love to go to the fair. He's never had a grade lower than an A. He loves fly fishing with his grandpa. I've lived in California all of my life, and I always go to the fair. Fair foods are all about batters, and batters are all about proportions, ratios, and science. That's me. Please welcome Chef Holden. Chef Holden seems like a very nice person, but I don't think he's gonna hold back. Okay, chefs, for round three, the menu items are... Lifeline. You can ask a judge to provide feedback on one of the components of your dish. Prime time. Take five minutes off your opponent's cook time. You bet your knife. Pick the one knife your opponent will be allowed to use for the challenge. So, Chef Holden, what's your selection? I choose you bet your knife. You bet your Woo! knife. Now, Holden, please approach Chef Tony's station and choose the only knife that he may work with. Let's see how many knives you brought today, Chef Tony. What is the knife that you've selected from Chef Tony's kit? The Tournaying knife. Oh, there's no way. Yeah. Woo! Woo! A Tournay knife is usually used for tourneying, which is some really strange, fun garnishing technique in French cooking. <laughs> I am diabolical. Chefs, you have one hour to create a Fair Foods trio. Your dishes will be tasted blindly by master level chef, Brooke Williamson. Your time starts now. <laughs> what do you think about when you think about Fair Foods? Fried, 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 fried. <laughs> Start putting it, it's so little. A uh, tourney knife is used in very classical French cooking to cut vegetables into this football shape. Jeez, he's doing pretty good. Wow. Uh -oh. Thankfully, with Fair Foods, it's not so refined. I will not have to be using a lot of knife work. For my Fair Food trio, I'm going a little outside of the box with this. I'm making a donut grilled cheese with lemon ice. I'm also making a banana fritter with avocado sauce, a street style corn with nori, and a spicy aioli. I first decide to make granita. It's a fancy lemon ice. To make granita, I use equal parts juice, sugar, and water. And I go directly to the blast chiller. That's gonna be pretty sweet. And Holden is still getting ingredients. In a competition like this, you have to work on every single thing all at once. And at this point, I'm trying to figure out what I can do for this challenge. Um, this is pre-cut. No, I want slab. Larry! Look at him over there. He's already um, he looks SD, like SD, SD, SD. Calm it down. You're going to move it too hard on him. Making a avocado smoothie to go with the banana fritter. 
A banana fritter is a very traditional Vietnamese dessert. An avocado smoothie is also a very traditional Vietnamese dessert. I'm thinking they're going to be great together. A nice, cool, creamy avocado milkshake. Yeah, I love those. Once pureed, I stick it into the refrigerator, keep it cold. I'm going to wait till the last minute to fry the banana. So I have the bacon, and I'm thinking chicken fried bacon. Chicken fried bacon is something that's kind of unusual, but you can find it at a fair. That's uneven. I slice up some bacon, I put in some buttermilk with a bit of Tabasco, and I just leave it there for a while. OK, next would be the... Hold on, focus, focus, focus. Wow, I'm really scattered today. No, 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 this is not my fault. So I'm really not sure what I'm going to make, but I'm thinking fair's funnel cake. But I want to make a spice funnel cake because it takes it up a level. 41 minutes later, he's still making his mixtures for coating. Chef Holden seems very unfocused, which is not very good for the prodigies. Holden, get up your game! Get up your game! I'm gonna make a donut grilled cheese. I've seen donut burgers and fairs before. This is my inspiration. I've never eaten a grilled cheese donut before, but it's donut and melted cheese. How could that be bad? So we will see. 30 minutes, chefs. I have two dishes figured out, and I still have one more to go. I like corn dogs every time I go to the fair, so mini corn dogs it is. And to elevate my corn dog, it will be paired with a grain mustard mayonnaise. What? Yeah, I need to clear some air. He has nowhere to put it. Oh my, hold it. A clean station is a clean mind. And when you got all that stuff going on, it's really hard to focus on what you're doing. He's working on so many different things at once, he needs to just get one thing finished at a time. How's it going, Holden? Pretty good, how are you? Um, I'm very curious what you're making for fair food. What we got going on, brother? OK, I have multiple things going on. First off, I am making a cinnamon funnel cake. And it is going to have this, which is a going to be a Mexican chocolate sauce. I am making mini corn dogs. And then I'm going to be making chicken fried bacon. Very interesting, really exciting. Uh, is it true that you pretty much have never scored under an A on any test? For the most part, that is correct. So if you didn't win this challenge, would that kind of be like getting a B? It's like getting a C, oh. which is pretty much to me an F. Lot on the line. Really excited for Chef Brooke to taste what you make. Thank you. Good luck, pal. How are we doing, Chef Tony? Uh, not doing so well. I didn't realize we only have 25 minutes left. OK, so, so time is getting away from you? A little bit. Can you tell me everything you're working on real quick? Simple grilled cheese donut, banana fritter mm -hmm. with avocado smoothie. And then what would about the lemon granite? Oh, I'm happy you remind me about that. Oh, you're too I'm happy you remind me about that. <laughs> um, is it hard getting through this challenge with just a tornado? <laughs> <laughs> when Adam reminds me about my lemon ice, I'm so relieved and really shocked that I forgot about it. Good luck, man. <laughs> I love it. Street style corn on the cob is a lot of balance, tanginess, spiciness, salty, sweet. And my corn will be inspired by Asian flavors. OK, chefs, 10 minutes left. Final 10 minutes. Oh, my god. I'm getting completely scatterbrained. I have to step back from my station for a second, take a deep breath, and start cleaning off my station. Hold it. Ain't nobody got time for that. There is time for that. This is not only a chance to clean it, but it is also giving me a chance to collect my thoughts. After cleaning my station, I feel great, and I know what I have to do. So I have to make the funnel cake, and I have to finish my mini corn dogs and put them in the fryer. I'm feeling OK on time, but I know that the time will catch up to me. I'm waiting for the last minute to fry these bananas. I want them to stay crispy. And thankfully, the granita looks very fluffy and solid, like a perfect lemon ice. Chefs, this is the two minute warning. I only have a couple minutes left, and I really need to start plating. This is the last round. The entire competition is relying on me. 90 seconds. Seconds are winding down, and everything's coming together the way I hoped. 
Coming up on 30 seconds, chefs. It looks like fair food, but very refined. I'm feeling confident. Good, good, good. Come on, plate, plate, plate. Bueno, bueno. He's okay, gonna make it, ladies and gentlemen. You're gonna he make is. it. He is gonna make it. Three, two, one. Stop cooking, step away. Woo! Time's up. And I look down at my plate, and it's very brown. But welcome to the fair. OK, chefs, please bring your plates up to the judges. This is the last round. This is winner takes all, a blind taste test of fair food. The entire competition is relying on me. Looking at Chef Holden's trio, I think it's going a little safe. I feel like I thought outside of the box a little bit more. Chef Holden, what did you prepare for Chef Brooke? Here I have prepared for Chef Brooke a mini corn dog with a green mustard mayonnaise, chicken fried bacon with a spiced maple syrup, and a cinnamon funnel cake with powdered sugar, strawberries, and Mexican chocolate. Chef Tony, what did you prepare for Chef Brooke? For Chef Brooke, I prepared a banana fritter with avocado sauce, street style corn with nori, and the grilled cheese donut, and to accompany that, a lemon ice. Best of luck, chefs. Thank you. Will raw talent and imagination defeat years of training and decades of experience? Who was bold and who played it safe? Let's find out. Please welcome back our round three Fair Foods trio guest judge and master chef, Chef Brooke Williamson. <laughs> chef Brooke, welcome back. Thank you. So this is a blind taste test, chef, meaning you have no idea who cooked what. Remember, you're judging the dishes based on creativity, presentation, adherence to the spirit of the challenge, and of course, taste. Chef, please try the dish on your left first. It's very important that Chef Williamson loves my trio. This is it. This is the last round. I'm actually really surprised. It's a lot. Honestly, this granita was really beautifully balanced. The fact that it went with this donut grilled cheese, I don't know that it made much sense as a dish together. They felt like very separate dishes. This corn on the cob, I would venture to say, is one of my favorite bites, although I was nervous to bite into it because it was really overwhelming. There's so much on here, there's so much going on, but tasting it, it was really well balanced. It was really a perfect bite of corn. And then the banana fritter might be one of my least favorite favorite bites because it didn't work with the avocado and the avocado was sweet and wasn't balanced out with salt and therefore this fried banana that was a little bit heavy batter wise for me needed something to counterbalance the the richness and the sweetness of it and I wasn't getting that from the avocado. She has to be right about the banana fritter. It might have been too thick. I'm in a tough spot. The person who made this thought outside the box and did some really interesting stuff that you wouldn't expect to see on a plate of food from a fair. Thank you very much, Chef. Now, please try the dish on your right. Chef Brooke Williamson takes a bite, and she has no expression for a few seconds. And then she's happy. It looks like she's really enjoying it, but it's been close calls all day. So I have no idea how it's going to turn out. To start off, this corn dog is really a perfectly done mini corn dog, which is kind of all I want. Couple of perfect bites. And the funnel cake, it was nice and crispy on the outside and moist on the inside. That chocolate sauce, I love dark chocolate, and I feel like spice goes really well with dark chocolate and the cinnamon, it, that was kind of a perfect bite. The bacon here was cut a little bit too thin, dried it out a little bit, although technically on the plate, it's one of the more interesting elements. As a whole, I would say this is a really well-executed plate of food. My only negative is that it's not incredibly inspired. For the most part, my reviews are positive, but the chicken fried bacon was overdone. I am now less confident than I was before. Now, before we announce the winner of tonight's Man vs. Child Challenge, prodigies, please enter the kitchen. Well, Chef, who's the winner of tonight's Man vs. Child? If only it were that simple. <laughs> this is honestly one of the toughest decisions I've ever had to make. My favorite has to be... this dish. Yeah! <laughs> nice Congratulations, prodigies. I could not be happier, and my team is proud of me. And that was a good corn dog. 
I'm shocked. <laughs> How do you feel about the fact that you picked a prodigy's plate? Yeah, I mean, it's it's incredible that someone so young can be cooking so perfectly. And that's really why I picked this plate, because it felt restrained and simple and a plate that a professional would put together. Honestly, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Chef Tony. Thank you. Thank you. I'm disappointed about the judgment, but I'm really excited about the future of cooking. I'm proud of all the young, aspiring chefs, and if this is the future, then uh, we're in good hands. Congratulations, prodigies. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll see you next time on Man vs. Child. You're about to witness a culinary revolution. Tonight, five of the most talented cooking prodigies in the world go head-to-head -head against executive chefs with years of training and decades of experience. There's no way I'm going down. I don't want to be treated like a kid. I'm a chef. You just can't underestimate these kids. I'm going to crush that competition. It's a culinary showdown in three rounds, with our final round judged by the world's most critically acclaimed chefs in a winner-takes-all line taste test. It's the superstars of tomorrow. Way to get in his head. Against the titans of today. Coming down to the wire. I want to show the world that kids can take down executive chef. This is cutting it so close. This is Man vs. Child, Chef Showdown. I'm your host, Adam Gertler, and this week, it's a culinary showdown in three rounds. Our first judge is chef owner of several restaurants, including Graffiato and Kopnos, Mike Isabella. Our second judge is a butcher and private chef to Hollywood A-listers, Alia Zane. Our challenger today has chefed for such greats as Luda Lefebvre and Thomas Henkelman. He's been an executive chef for 20 years and is no stranger to competitive cooking. I've had the privilege of working for two very amazing chefs. I'm passionate about food because I was a latchkey kid, no joke, that had to fend for himself. By eight years old, I was already missing school, but I knew if I like watched Jeff Smith, the frugal gourmet all day, I'd get like rad ideas and my mom would totally forgive me. So she'd come home to like a 19 course dinner. I was one of these prodigies. I still feel like I am. I just got no hair and a gray beard now. Please welcome Chef Frank Ott. Prodigies, round one. Who's it gonna be? I'm looking at these kids and I'm not really worried. I'm always ready to compete. These kids are going down. Esty is a perfect pick for round one. She will eat anything and she knows good flavors. Worst case scenario, if something goes wrong, she can just smile and give the other chef a hug. It's a very cute distraction. So prodigies, who are we sending down? We choose Chef Esty. She's seven years old, dances, and sings in Mandarin. But most of all, she has considered herself a chef since the age of three. When I was three, I got a chef coat and a chef hat. I realized I really wanted to be a chef. My friends, they aren't into cooking as much as I am, so they're like, you can't cook. I'm ready for this. I'm here to win. I'm gonna crush that competition. She's tiny but mighty. Please welcome Chef Esty. Chef Esty. I'm blown away that someone her stature could even stand two minutes in the kitchen next to me. But I brought my A-game today. No one likes to win more than me. I like fine dining as much as anyone else. I really do. But sometimes, I just want something delicious. Mike, Alia, today's round one challenge is finger foods. What? Foods you find at a party, that perfect cross of salty, crunchy satisfaction. I love finger foods. I am a finger food junkie because you can have like a bunch of different stuff at one sitting. Finger foods says it in their name. You can eat it with your hands. Most finger foods are like fair foods. That means I need a fryer. You'll have 30 minutes to prepare your favorite finger foods. Our judges will be looking at creativity, presentation, adherence to the spirit of the challenge, and of course, taste. 
Remember, at the end of the round, not only will Mike and Alia taste and critique your dishes, they will also allow the chef with the best dish to choose an advantage from our menu. I really want to have an advantage in the next round. Even though I'm younger than Chef Frank, I'm going to beat him up. Judges, any advice? Really try to elevate these staple dishes. Be creative. Try to push yourself to think outside the box. But remember, finger foods could be tricky. Go overboard, and you're going to wind up with a greasy mess. OK, chefs, please take to the burners and prepare to begin your first cook. Good luck. Good luck. Jess, you have 30 minutes to prepare a finger food. And your time starts now. I cannot believe Chef Esty is seven years old and competing against me. You know, I'm six times her age. I feel like I have to do at least four times the dish. I've cooked in every realm you can imagine in this industry. I feel like 20-something years of experience will prepare me for victory today. So for this round, I'm going to make warm goat cheese filled mushroom caps. I'm also going to marinate cucumbers, fill them with guacamole. My third dish is shrimp that I wrap with sage and pancetta. And my throwaway dish is frizzled onions. Now, if you were in this round, would you stick to one finger food? How would you approach it? I want to focus on one thing, because if you do three finger foods, and one's really good, and one's not good at all, it kind of defeats the whole purpose. I know that I could win this round with one dish, but it's like lotto. You got to be in it to win it. Evidently, I feel like I have nothing but time, and I'm crazy. Four apps in a half hour is well within my wheelhouse. Not a big deal. Good, SD. Come on. Get to work. Good, SD, you're already five minutes in. Chef SD is taking forever. So I haven't started cooking. My time is ticking away. All of a sudden, boom. I don't know what to do. I'm going to make fried chicken, but I'm going to make it Korean instead of Kentucky. What's, is that kimchi? Kimchi? So she's doing something kind of Asian inspired. SD got kimchi out of the fridge, which is an Asian vegetable that's fermented in a jar. It's sometimes spicy. You know, and I feel like that's going to be really good for a finger food. Esty over there scares the poop out of me. I, I can't lie to you. Esty, how you feeling over there? Good. Feel good? Yeah. What grade are you in? Second. Ah, uh, awesome. So having done a lot of parties with finger foods, I'm going to do the old classic fill some mushroom caps. So right away, I knew classic finger foods, stuffed mushrooms. Like, who, who doesn't want to eat a stuffed mushroom? I separate the stems. I get them sauteing with some shallots and thyme. The mushroom caps, I put in another saute pan, and I start roasting them with some garlic, fresh thyme, salt, and pepper. I throw them in the oven. I want them to cook through, releasing their moisture. When in doubt, add more expensive olive oil. That's what I always say. He knows his ingredients. And he also seems very organized. Look at him. OK, yeah, and Esty, she's falling behind. Esty, OK, come on. Esty, <laughs> you need help, babe. Can I help you? Thank you. I can't lift up the Here. sugar. Just that? Oh, she's playing the game right. Look oh. at that. Thank you. There you go, sister. <laughs> Esty is the most adorable kid. I can't even take it. I'm distracted by how cute she is. And then I see Esty has her shopping basket completely full of crazy ingredients. So I'm terrified. This little girl knows what she's doing. What's going on? She's like a little adult. Did you know she loves to throw dinner parties? Yeah, every Monday, Esty hosts a huge family get-together with themed meals. She organizes everything down to party favors wow. and even gets all dressed up for the occasion. Ah, it's like Esty's uh, pop-up restaurant. <laughs> well, the world is changing. Instead of the usual cartoons and sitcoms, it's a whole generation of youth that's been raised on cooking shows. Yeah, I can, I can really see how they can give you a head start in cooking. I learned mostly all that in culinary school. I just love chicken wings. They're really good and yummy. What makes my chicken wings very Korean is that the marinade I add them in has sesame oil and also yuzu to make it really flavorful. For me, finger foods should be the starch, the veg, sauce, and the, oh my god, that was so good, wrapped into one bite. As long as I keep everything relatively small, I know everything will cook in 30 minutes. Hmm, OK, he's not doing one thing. He's doing four separate dishes. I think that might be a little bit too extreme. I'm going to make my goju jang a streak from scratch. Goju jang is a really, really spicy hot pepper paste. I'm adding this because the judges will devour it and love this goju jang a streak. Good day, Chef Esty. How are you? Good. You are uh, covered with a little bit of flour, I, I see. I know. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. 
you got the fried chicken, you're gonna have the gochujang glaze on there, and uh, how does the kimchi work into it? It's gonna be in a ramekin. And that's gonna mix with the mayo? Yeah. That sounds delicious. All right, good luck, Chef Esty. Thank you. Take no mercy. She looks like she's doing really well, honestly. <laughs> Chef Frank, how's yes, it going, sir. man? It's going good, it's going good. I feel the pressure of uh, 11 minutes left. All right, what do you got going on? I got some roasted mushrooms filled with uh, duck cell with goat cheese. I got some classic onion rings. Okay. Got some prawns here with sage, wrap them in pancetta. I have some marinated cucumbers. Gonna make a little chopped avocado guacamole. So you're, you're working on several finger foods. Confirmed? Okay. So I'm gonna try not to hang myself. There's a lot going on over here. Sometimes a little less is, is a little bit more. Good luck, <laughs> 10 Thank minutes you. left. 10 minute chefs. At this moment, I'm a little nervous. Time isn't the problem. The problem is I'm an overachiever. I may have buried myself with a little too much work. I may have buried myself with a little too much work. Time isn't the problem. The problem is I'm an overachiever. My chicken has been cooking for 10 minutes. I saw a nice golden brown that lets me know that's completely finished. Now, stop fighting. Ooh, it looks really pretty. But is it fully cooked? I'm extremely confident with this dish. I think Frank's gonna way underestimate me. Three minutes, chefs, three minutes. So I'm waiting for the last second to do the onions. It just gets tossed with flour and deep fried for a second. He's, He's just, just adding his onion rings. Uh, okay. You can already hear the critique. The bacon's soggy. I'm running out of time. Um, my shrimp have been in the pan a minute, and they're not even sizzling. Wait a minute, did you come to help me? Ugh, like a shark. Way to get in his head. Sabotage. Oh. Serious. Chef Esty playing her game. She knows the cuteness factor. She's mad-dogging this guy. It's important to win the first round, not just to get the advantage, but really, I hate losing. Chef Esty may be cute, but I don't want to lose, especially to a kid. One minute, chefs. I feel like I'm way ahead of the game, so I just chilled out and ate a banana. What else would you do? She better hope her chicken's cooked. I hope it's cooked with all that taunting. I'm running out of time. I have no choice. I'm hoping that the shrimp are cooked through. I really want to put toothpicks in them. There's just no time. Three, two, one. That's time. Step away. Chef Esty, step away from the banana. So I look over at Esty's dish and I'm blown away that it's a cohesive dish. I'm looking at both the dishes and Chef Esty has this in the bag, in the shopping cart. <laughs> Chef Esty, could you please explain your dish? This is my Korean fried chicken with a kimchi mayonnaise and a goju jenga street. Well, Esty, this looks like a nice plate of finger food. I'm excited to bite into this today. Thank you. Dip some less sauce. You really surprised me, Chef Esty. Thank you. I was a little nervous. I didn't know if the chicken was in the fryer for that long. I was afraid we were gonna get some undercooked chicken, but this is very well cooked. The gastrique itself is very nice as well. Not too overpowering. It balances really nicely with the kimchi mayo. With that being said, you had all that extra time. I really wish you would have made your own mayo. I preferred it a little bit on the thicker side. You could have started with the acid of the kimchi juice and then have it be a little bit thicker like that. Thanks. Well done. Yeah, see, I agree. It was cooked perfectly. It was nice and juicy. It was crispy Thanks. on the outside. I like the fact that you didn't put too much of the gastrique on top of it, so it would have made it soggy, but it didn't. So you have that flavor of the spice, but it could have used a little bit more garnish on the plate, some more green, maybe some more scallion, something along the lines of that. Thank you. Chef Frank, what did you prepare for us today? What I prepared for you today is a pan-roasted mushroom filled with some warm goat cheese, marinated Persian cucumbers, salt and mocha, and finally I made just some frizzled onions. Everything looks, you know, bite-sized, ready to eat. I think with the exception of the shrimp, but it sounds like the intention was there. Yeah, I mean, the plate's beautiful. I love it how you have everything individual. You have all different colors going on. You have some fried food. You have the greens, the reds. It's very bright, very colorful. It's a beautiful dish. Thank you. Okay, let's taste Frank's dish. How should we eat this shrimp? I suggest you just pop it in your mouth and enjoy it. This one looks under.
Chef Ott, your dish was very, very well composed. I highly commend you on that. Everything looked very beautiful. Thank you. One thing I really liked was actually the cucumber, the coolness and the crispness of the cucumber with the richness and the fattiness of the avocado. The onion straws, I think those were also very tasty. Those are my two favorites. These ones, I wasn't the biggest fan of. The shrimp is not quite cooked all the way, and the mushroom was lacking in salt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I agree and disagree. I thought the mushroom was, was cooked perfectly. I also really like the cucumber. This is a very ambitious dish. The first half of it, amazing. The other half of it, uh, you know, the shrimp was raw. It was a bad dish. Whenever I go into competition, I always try to focus on one, maybe two dishes, because if you have a great dish and then you have a dish here that's basically the worst dish, now you're kind of changing your judging mentality. It's not just one thing we're focused on. Now we're focused on a couple things. Thank you. You guys both presented quality dishes. But now we have something to talk about, so give us a minute. Winning against a seven-year-old with one dish that I prepared better, that's not how I wanted to go out. So I did overachieve, because winning is always the most important thing to me. This could go either way. I could win, which would be good, but Chef Frank has a million dishes. He might win. Mike, Alia, who gets to pick an advantage from the menu for our next round? So at the end of the day, we've decided that the advantage goes to We've decided that the advantage goes to... Chef Esty. Yeah! I won! Yeah. Yeah. This is the best day of my life so far. Esty, you must now choose one of your remaining teammates to compete with an advantage against Chef Ott in the next round. But before we get to that, I bet you're wondering what round two is all about. It's surf and turf. What? As you can see, it's not just any surf and turf. It's bizarre surf and turf. It's my wheelhouse right there. <laughs> you have 45 minutes to create a bizarre surf and turf using our collection of highly unorthodox ingredients. Ingredients like gooey duck, uni, abalone, goat, black chicken, and alligator. Remember, nobody likes food poisoning. So pick your proteins carefully. I've cooked every single item up there. I know most of these kids haven't touched a single one of them. Chef Esty, which one of your teammates will compete with control of the advantage board in round two? I choose Holden. Chef Holden, enter the kitchen. Yeah. I choose Holden to go next, because. I bet he's well experienced with all these czar ingredients, so he'll know how to use them into his dish. He waltzes, plays five instruments, and is the busiest 14-year-old in the US. I know every single thing when I'm walking into a test and the show. It's a giant math test. What sets me apart from other kids my age is my passion and my drive. A lot of people, after one or two tries, will just give up, but that is not me. Please welcome Chef Holden. Okay, chefs, so you know your challenge. However, we have one more piece of business to get to before we start cooking. In the last round, Chef Esty won. So, Chef Holden, you get to pick an advantage from the menu board in round two. This round, the menu items are... Prime time. Take five minutes off your opponent's time. More ingredients, more problems. Throw a culinary curveball to your opponent. Pick any ingredient you want at any time that your opponent must incorporate into the dish. One-stop shopping. Your opponent will only be allowed one trip to the pantry. Chef Holden, what's your choice? I'm thinking since it is a bizarre surf and turf round, I can really give him a challenge with different ingredients. More ingredients, more problems. More ingredients, more problems. So at any point during the round, Chef Holden may introduce any three ingredients to your dish that you have to incorporate. Chef Frank, how do you feel about that? Uh, I feel great. Holden, you ready to run with the big dog? I can see losing to a seven-year-old in the first round has not humbled you at all. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. OK, chefs, take to the burners and prepare to begin your cook. Chefs, you have 45 minutes to produce a bizarre surf and turf. And your time starts now. Mm -hmm. 
So I pick black chicken to be my turf, and I pick the sea urchins to be my surf. I can cook chicken, and sea urchins are something I love and I'm very used to cooking. Wow, Holden got this fast and he knows what he's doing. The two things that pop out at me are the black chicken and the gooey duck. So I choose to use the gooey duck as my surf and the black chicken as my turf. They're both used in Asian cuisine. So I'm going to make an Asian-inspired soup. In order to win this challenge, I have to do something innovative, something that's not the normal chicken noodle. For my surf and turf, I'm making chicken crepinette with uni hollandaise sauce, roasted artichoke puree, and tomato confit. Making a chicken crepinette is something I pretty much do all the time. Chicken crepinette is essentially a chicken wrapped in fat and cooked. I knew that if I could stick to my comfort zone, no matter what he threw at me, I'd be able to handle it. Now he's got the pressure cooker out. Would you think that that's a good way to approach the chicken? I definitely think it's a good way of approaching the chicken. The key with the pressure cooker is you want to get some heat in there. You want to make sure that you bring everything up to temp before you close it, or else it's going to take a very long time to come to temp. Black chicken skin is actually pigmented black, and every organ in his body is naturally black. That's weird. So I think it's going to add an extra depth of flavor. One of the main components of my dish is the soup broth. I'm using the pressure cooker because I need the black chicken to infuse all of its flavors inside the chicken stock. It will take about five minutes to get to its pressurized state. That should be fine. It needs about 30 minutes to cook. I have 45. I still have my sabotage for you. Bring it, Doug. I'm ready. Um, you have to use anchovies. I like anchovies, son. I'm glad Chef Holden evidently thinks anchovies are awful because I think they're awesome. So I put the anchovies into the tomatoes. It creates kind of a Provencal flavor. This is perfect. Chef Frank, why don't you add bananas to that? Banana. Oh. <laughs> oh, he has to do a banana. He has to do a banana. <laughs> that was a really good one. Kind of threw me for a loop. Yeah, I don't know what I would do with bananas. Oh my god, I got to put banana into my Provencal chicken dish. Great. Then I realized bananas really aren't strong in flavor. They're mostly just sweet. So I thought, okay, let's add some sweetness to the artichoke puree. How's that? Tastes pretty good. I have thrown bananas and anchovies at Chef Ott, and none of it is seeming to phase him. My pressure cooker isn't popping up. Switch burners. My pressure cooker is not pressurized. I have no idea what's going on. I want to just give it some time, and hopefully it will pressurize. I pick up the uni. I realize they're nice and dense. I'm happy that I still feel moisture in there. That means these are going to be some beautiful fresh uni. Uni is labor intensive. I cut it open with scissors, and I have to gently scrape out all the roe. So if I could get this uni hollandaise sauce prepared the right way, it should be awesome. Chef Holden. All right, so you have the siphon portion of the gooey duck right there. Are you serving it raw? I am. As I am very thinly slicing the gooey duck, I decide I'm going to put it on top of the soba noodles that are floating in the broth. You want it to complement what you have, because it is very salty. It's fresh out of the ocean. Are you at all concerned about what Chef Ott is cooking? No, because I still have one more ingredient. OK. Well, take care of your noodles. Take care of your soup. Good luck with the pressure cooker. Thank you. Chef Ott. Hi. What's up? I see the black chicken is actually wrapped up in its own skin. Confirmed. Yes, it is. It's wrapped up in its own skin. And now, what is the surf portion of your surf and turf? It's going to be this uni hollandaise sauce, OK? Which is just going to be whipped up with a little white wine. So what did you learn from the first round? It seemed like you tried to be a little too ambitious to kind of hurt you, maybe cost you the first round. Have you uh, changed a strategy from round two? Uh, I'm just keeping it simple, working in my wheelhouse. After the last round, I learned that overachieving isn't always fantastic. All right, thank you very much, Chef. I'm really excited to see what you come up with here. Thank you, so am I. My pressure cooker needs about a half an hour, and I don't have that time. I'm worried it's not going to be chicken flavored enough. Holden? does not have the typical look of confidence on his face that we're used to seeing from him. I think the pressure cooker is too much pressure for him. I'm getting nervous. We are starting to worry because we think that Holden's broth isn't totally cooked. At least Holden has one more ingredient to throw at Chef Frank. Holden, white chocolate. No, I'm trying to say, think of something that he will have trouble with. I'm deciding to throw him some sort of curveballs. How would you like to use ketchup? Ketchup, huh? Ketchup doesn't really scare me. I know I could put it into the oil for the tomatoes and create kind of a broken looking sauce. I think ketchup actually would taste pretty good in there. Chefs, five minutes. It looks good. It looks like it came together pretty well for only 20 minutes. I'm looking at all the flavor of the black chicken. 
I taste it. It does not have enough chicken flavor. I have two minutes left, and there's really nothing I can do at this point. Time is almost up. So I take my black chicken broth off the heat, and I taste it. It does not have enough chicken flavor because of the pressure cooker. If it had the 30 minutes, it would be perfect, but it did not. So I then add soy sauce and salt to try to get it to the right flavor. I hope it turns out okay. One minute! I laid my artichoke down. I slice and fan out the chicken. I hit it with my uni hollandaise. I take a step back. I'm very happy with my dish. Five, four, three, two, one, hands up, step away from the plates. I really hope Chef Ott did not use the ingredients I threw at him well. I can't let him have an advantage in the final round. The third round is everything, and we're all still fighting to prove that kids can cook. Thank you, chefs. Please remember the menu disadvantage will not be taken into consideration by the judges. They're only looking at creativity, presentation, adherence to the spirit of the challenge, and of course, taste. Chef Holden, please explain your dish. Here I have made for you an Asian-inspired chicken soup with soba noodles and gooey duck. Thank you, Chef. The restraint that you had while plating was very commendable. Less is definitely more. Your presentation looks nice. Wish it could have a little bit more broth in there. I really liked the idea that you had for this dish. Asian-inspired chicken noodle soup. There's definitely chicken in it. There's definitely noodles in it. I get the Asian influence with the ingredients that you used. However, it fell a little flat for me, not having the pressure cooker heated on time. I'm not getting a lot of... Um, chicken flavor? Chicken flavor, yeah. I agree with Alia. Your pressure cooker came to a boil when you had 17 minutes left. Correct. This needs to cook for 25 to 30 minutes after it's caramelized at a high heat pressure. So your flavor didn't really develop. It was a beautiful dish. The noodles were cooked perfectly. I like the technique of how you cut the gooey duck clam and put it on top. But again, you just had to develop a little bit more flavor. Uh... Chef Frank, what have you prepared for us? Today I prepared a crepinette of chicken breast. I made a puree of artichoke. I tried to make like a Provencal style sauce. Uh, and finally, I made a hollandaise sauce with the uni. You know, your craftsmanship with the chicken is really well done. I think you did a really good job butchering that. I like the garnishes on your plate. I love that the Provencal feel. Chef Frank, I was really interesting to see how you were going to incorporate the banana and the anchovy and the ketchup. And you surprised me, and it actually tastes very, very good. The addition of the banana to the artichoke was really lovely. I get the cleanness of the artichoke, and you kind of get the sweetness from the banana. I really like the chicken. Using the thigh skin and the breast skin and really marrying those two birds together and throwing in the herbs added really nice flavor. Thank you. You know, overall, it was a good dish, but in this competition, it's about surf and turf. And I didn't taste any sea urchin. Maybe, you know, poaching the little tongues of the sea urchin in olive oil or maybe a little butter and kind of putting it on top of the chicken might have been a little bit of a better idea than just kind of pureeing it up with a lot of other ingredients. But overall, I thought it was a good dish. Chicken cooked well, and I enjoyed it. Thank you, Chef. So the judges seem relatively positive about my dish, and that's good. I really want to impress the judges. I mean, these are my colleagues. You know, overall, both of you chefs created two great dishes. We just need a moment to kind of go over it to see what we have to say. Because I'm familiar with most of these things on my plate and how they work together, I feel like this one may be a win. I am freaking out right now. If only that pressure cooker pressurized faster. Mike, Alia, who gets to pick an advantage from the menu for the next round? We decided that the advantage goes to. So at the end of the day, we decided that the advantage goes to. Chef Frank. Thank you. Man is redeemed. I won a round. As always, the third and final challenge will be a trio challenge that will be tasted blindly by our master level chef. Chef Frank, not only is this upcoming round the winner takes all round, but now you'll enter into it with control of the menu board. <laughs> <laughs> but before we get to all that, I'd like to present our master level chef judge to introduce round three. In 2001, she opened her modern chop house, Jar, and has won numerous awards for her classic American food. Please welcome Chef Suzanne Trek. Suzanne Trek, she's an amazing chef. 
I have so much respect for women of her generation that came up in this business. They had to fight a lot harder than us guys. Sometimes the test for a great chef, it's not what you cook, but it's how you cook it. So today, chefs, we are doing a technique trio. I'd like you to cook a single dish using three different techniques. For most of us executive chefs, dynamic range is not a problem. But for a child, it certainly could be a problem. When I see a beautiful ingredient, I right away want to cook it three ways. I know every single person on my team can do this technique trio. My biggest concern is who can handle this disadvantage. Chef, thank you very much for your help. We'll call you in when it's time for you to judge. I'm looking forward to it. Best of luck. A technique trio it is. It's time now for the big question, Holden. Which one of your teammates, despite disadvantage, is going to bring it home for the prodigies in round three? Let's have Chef Cloyce redeem us. Chef Cloyce can definitely do this. I know he can handle disadvantages, and he's been cooking the longest out of all of us. Chef Cloyce, enter the kitchen. He's 14 years old. His favorite dishes to prepare include herb-crusted salmon and molten chocolate cake with creme anglaise. I started cooking when I was four, so I've been cooking for almost a decade. Instead of cartoons, I watched cooking shows. Through that, I found my passion for cooking, and that started a whole lifelong learning process. I want to show the world that kids can cook, and we can take down executive chefs. Please welcome Chef Cloyce. It's the last round. I got to really make sure my knife skills are fine-tuned for this round. I need, you know, all my blaze of glory. <laughs> I gotta kill this competition. So, Chef Frank, you get to pick an advantage. For round three, the menu items are Lifeline. You can ask a judge to provide feedback on one of the components of your dish. Station vacation. Force your opponent to stop working at any point for five minutes. Truly tasteless. Your opponent will not be allowed to taste anything during the cook period. Any ingredients or component tasted will be discarded. Those are bad. Oh. <laughs> I think station vacation will be the most oh. effective. All right, well, station vacation it is. Station vacation, it's definitely a disadvantage, but already I have some ideas of how to overcome this. I'm ready. Bring it. Chefs, take to the burners and get ready to begin your cook. Chefs, you have one hour to create a trio showcasing your technical skills. Your dishes will be tasted blindly by Chef Suzanne Tracht. And remember, this round's for the win. And your time starts now. You got this, boys. I will be doing a trio of scallops. A scallop mousseline served with English pea puree, a crudo served over very gently scrambled eggs, and then diver sea scallops served with a ragu of shiitake mushroom. So first, I'm making a mousseline of scallop. I learned this while working at L'Orangerie with Ludovic Lefebvre. We're gonna make an emulsification of scallop. We're gonna make it light with cream and egg white, and we're gonna poach it. Mousseline is incorporating air. So when I'm whipping the scallop inside the food processor, I'm creating air. It's kind of like you're eating a cloud that tastes like scallop. See eggs, a lot of vegetables, a scallop. They both grab scallops. I decided to go with scallop because the scallop's nice, delicate. There's a lot of different preparations I could go. For this challenge, I'm planning on doing a live scallop crudo with a PPA, a bay scallop ceviche. And for my third dish, I'm doing a pan-seared diver scallop with a cauliflower puree. Chef Frank has a station vacation that he can use anytime, and I definitely don't want to be in the situation where I'm cooking a scallop and he calls station vacation and it overcooks. So I decided to do two raw preparations of the scallop and I'm going to wait until the last 10 minutes to start cooking my diver scallop. Right now I'm starting on a cauliflower puree. As soon as I get the cauliflower cooking, I start on my ceviche. Oh, I love ceviche. I've made it more times than I can remember. This is a technique that I've learned from cooking shows. With ceviche, you're not actually cooking the fish. The citrus is doing all the hard work, so I gotta have the right ratio of citrus to the other flavorings. So I place the scallop mixture inside the plastic wrap, and I start twisting it, creating a sausage-looking cylinder. I take the package, and I cook it until it's cooked through. Chef, how you doing? Pretty good, how are you? Pretty good. You got a plan? Yeah, somewhat. Survival? Yeah, 
Chef Kois looks like he's out for blood. It's not just about winning for him, it's about burying me in the sand. <laughs> I am definitely the most competitive person on the team. I learned how to use a knife and started my knife skills at maybe seven or eight, so I think that the speed will definitely give me an edge. Chefs, 40 minutes remain in this challenge. Yes, sir, 40 minutes. I keep looking over my shoulder to see where Chef Cloyce is in his prep. I keep hoping he's gonna get a pan out or stick something in the oven. You got ceviche. So I see that, man, he's doing cold dishes. So my station vacation is not gonna work out. Chef Cloyce, how's it going? Pretty good, actually. How do you feel about your competition? You've watched him for two rounds so far? Yeah, I mean, he seems like he knows what he's doing. He's going to be tough to beat. What are you doing with the live scallop? Is that the crudo? Yeah, I'm going to serve the live scallop raw. I'm just going to go with a pea puree that I should start pretty soon. OK, good luck. Chef Frank, talk to me. Howdy. So it looks like we're having a little battle scallop going on here. <laughs> it seems that way. If you look at the garnishes I have, there's mm -hmm. no strong flavors, really. So you see me over here eating it raw, I love it. Yeah. So you don't want to do too much to it. Great. All right, very exciting. Thank you. It would seem that we have two very different approaches to scallops here. On Chef Cloyce's side, it seems like there's a lot more complicated sauces and garnishes. As opposed to Chef Frank's side, he's going for some very mild flavors. I love that, though. I think that's mm -hmm. very smart. I'm going out of my comfort zone because of the disadvantage that I have. I don't think that I would have usually done a live scallop kudo. This is definitely not something I've done before. I'm going to serve it raw. And it's going to really fit for this competition. The shell is really gorgeous. That would be good for plating. That is correct. Chef, 20 minutes left. Just waiting for an opportune moment to try to put him in the weeds a little bit. The kid looks like he's not slowing down for nothing. Time's running out. I need to use my station vacation. I think Junior needs a five minute timeout right now. Right now? Right now. There it is. And that's a station vacation called. The clock starts now. Thank you, Frank. Honestly, that was perfect timing. Chef Cloyce does not look very bummed about the station vacation. Cloyce, do you have enough time to finish it after? Absolutely. That leaves me 10 minutes to pan see my base gallop. I'm good to go. So the mousseline is ready to cook. My goal is really that the scallop mousse will taste like scallop. The only thing I've done is reorganized its properties and turned it into something light and airy. I'm just sitting there watching all my stuff. I'm trying to make the best use of my time that I can. All right, well, let's think about what I'm doing. As soon as clock goes back on, Romanesco flights in there. I feel like my station vacation is really the chance for him to step back to make sure he dots all his I's and crosses his T's. I'm good to go. All right, Cloyce, your station vacation is now over. Back to work. For my second dish, I'm searing some diver sea scallops very gently. These scallops are so beautiful and fresh that it's a complete crime to cook them. But this is a trio challenge, and I need to do a different cooking method. For the third dish of my trio, I have a crudo, a raw sliced scallop, served over very gently scrambled eggs. So to make these eggs perfect, I need to get them started, take the chill off them, and then back them off. I will finish them when I'm ready to plate up. Jeff, you have five minutes. Please, he hasn't even started cooking his scallops takes two minutes, guys. Everything's gonna be okay. It's coming down to the wire. He still has to cook a scallop, and there's only four minutes left. This is cutting it so close. Boys, three and a half minutes. Three and a half minutes. I'm gonna start cooking it now. It's just about time. This is gonna cook in two minutes. I'll have plenty of time. Leave it alone. Let that get nice and caramelized. The eggs come off the stove perfect. Scallops sit right on top. It's dressed with some mocetra caviar. It's a winner, winner chicken dinner. Two minutes, chefs. Two minutes. Well, it's coming down to the wild. And the scallop is still in the pan. Perfect. Oh, beautiful. He's going to baste it with a minute and 20 seconds left to go. There's no fat inside a fish. So if you baste it with a little butter, you're incorporating some of that fat, and you're helping cooking it evenly throughout. You know, he may get it fully cooked when he's basting it like that. I'm very happy with my dish. The trio really represents experience, being able to manipulate the same product three different ways. But because it's a blind tasting, anything could happen. I want to win because my food's better, not because I have more experience. One minute, chefs. Twenty-seven seconds. Oh my god. Five, four, three, two. One, stop cooking. Step away from the plates, hands up. OK, chefs, please bring your plates up to the table. 
Oh, wow. Chef Cloyce, what did you prepare for Chef Trekt? Today I've prepared a live scallop kudo with a PPA and lemon zest. In the middle you have a base scallop ceviche, and on your right you have a pan-seared diver scallop with a cauliflower puree, salsa verde, and romanesco florets. Chef Frank, what did you prepare for Chef Trekt? Starting on your left, I prepared a seared dry scallop. In the center, we have a mousseline of scallop, served it over English pea puree. And finally, we have a crudo served over very softly scrambled eggs with ocetra caviar and chives. OK, best of luck, chefs. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck, chef. Good luck to you, too. Chefs, please welcome back our round three technique guest judge and master chef, Suzanne Tract. <laughs> chef Tract, welcome back. Thank you. Nice to be back. So this is a blind taste test, Chef, meaning you have no idea who cooked what. Remember, you're judging the dishes based on creativity, presentation, taste, and adherence to the spirit of the challenge. Chef Track, we're starting with the plate on your right. As Chef Track's eating my food, she smiles a little bit. She does that head nod. I think she's digging it. So Chef, what do you think of this dish? I like the presentation of it, but it tastes even better than it looks. Everything was right on. That's incredible. But in my opinion, I would like to see a little bit more color on the plate, give it a little bit more vibrance. The live scallop crudo was really great, very tasty. Personally, I would like more pea puree on the plate, give it a little bit more color. And it was so good, you know, it just left me wanting more. I wanted to press Chef Tract with my trio. I want to win so bad. All my prodigies are relying on me. OK, Chef, let's move on to the dish on your left. Suzanne Trek is eating my dish. I'm actually pretty excited about that. I want to win. There is no way I'm going down. Chef, what did you think of the taste of that trio? The tastes are good. They could be perfected, a little bit more seasoning. Scallops are very soft, so you kind of want to have a texture, maybe a little bit more crunchy with the scallops, other than the, the scrambled eggs and then the soft caviar. I really enjoy the way that the scallops are cooked though. They're cooked perfectly. I hear a little criticism in regards to textures, but you know what? I know how good that dish is. I've served it a thousand times. Well, Chef, thank you very much. We appreciate your input. Thank you. Now for the reveal of the winner of this week's Man vs. Child. Prodigies, please enter the kitchen. Winning is always the most important thing to me. I want to win for bragging rights. I'm a terrible loser. I can't go home having my crew calling me a loser lost to a kid. Will raw talent and imagination defeat years of training and decades of experience? Who displayed the best technical skill, overall presentation, and creativity? Who was truly bold and who played it safe? Well, Chef, who's the winner of tonight's Man vs. Child? Both dishes were really nicely composed, and they really have a lot of creativity to them. The winning dish for me is the plate on the right. Wow. Congratulations, prodigies. You've won. Right. It's super cool that I got to lead my team to victory. I'm overjoyed. Great day for the prodigies. It's really unbelievable that this dish was made by a 14-year-old chef. I wish my kids could cook like this. Thank you, Chef Track, for your participation. We really appreciate your input. Thank you. Thank you, Chef Frank. You did an excellent job. The pleasure's absolutely been mine. How, how inspiring it is to cook with all of you. Now that I see how wonderful these kids are, I really don't have a problem losing to them. And we'll see you next time on Man vs. Child. Yeah!